I'm <laughs> hold on. Beep. Beep. Yeah. That'll be the first time we ever had a flood making a podcast. <laughs> Go for it. All right. Well, welcome to the Ham Radio Workbench PCB design webinar. So I want to start out with making a few comments about what we're going to try to do today, and then uh, we'll get into the content. So uh, first of all, thanks very much, everybody, for being here. Thank you for listening to the podcast. Uh, we really, really appreciate uh, you spending time and, and being interested in learning how to build stuff. I think, uh, you know, a real- the base solder to the part and melt it with the soldering iron. Well, my job is done. <laughs> Well, that was useful. I, I, I would suggest everybody mute your mics so that we don't hear your dogs barking or your kids screaming. Um, and if you have any questions, unmute and ask a question, or you can put it in the chat. Rod VA3ON is uh, kindly volunteered to be the master control and will be monitoring the chat window. And uh, if you do put a question in the chat, then he'll bring it up and, and ask the question. So if you want to just queue up your questions, that's great. And of course, we can, we can talk about things live um, if that works as well. Uh, so one of the things that's really important, I think, in amateur radio is, is hands-on stuff. It's building stuff. It's learning. Uh, and most of us are uh, probably on this webinar are interested in that kind of stuff. And I realize that there's a tremendous spectrum of, of, of knowledge from I've never done any of this before to I've done this a lot and, you know, maybe I'll learn something. So I'm really not going to uh, be able to cover absolutely everything you need to know, but I want to give you enough of a high-level view today of the process of doing board design and answer some questions and maybe share a few uh, tips and tricks. And then we'll, we'll follow up probably with some other sessions where we can go into some aspects of this in more detail if you're interested. Uh, I do wanna also start out by blaming Paul Cowley and Mark Hatch if you guys are online because, um, because of a comment that you guys made on the Facebook page uh, was kind of a challenge, like something about, you know, can you show us how to do this? Right. And, I, and I said, sure. Next thing you know, thanks, Paul. There you are. Nice to see you. Um, so be, because of you guys, we're here. So if it weren't for your suggestion, we, we, you would have a Saturday. But instead, you're spending it with me. So, um, so thank you for that. I, I really appreciate the feedback. We always appreciate getting feedback. And um, let's see. Also, there's a PDF that I will walk you through here. Uh, that PDF is on our Ham Radio Workbench podcast webpage. So if you go to that web page and uh, look at projects at the very top, there is a link to this PDF file that I'll be walking you through. And we will figure out where to post the recording after the fact. Jeremy and I have been talking about having a uh, podcast YouTube channel, which is, does not mean we're going to turn into video YouTube guys. It just means that there may be something from time to time like this that might be useful to store as a video. So. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about uh, what we're going to walk through today. So we're going to try to do this in an hour. That's not going to happen. <laughs> when does it ever? Um, but we're surely not going to go more than two. Um, so we're, we're going to shoot for an hour, probably go to an hour and a half by the time we get through everything. So uh, the way I wanted to do this is uh, in a couple of, uh, a couple of parts. Uh, the first part is uh, what I kind of jokingly called the lightning round. What I want to do is I want to set the big picture so when I start learning something, what I really don't like to do is dive into the very first thing. Okay, uh, let me explain to you what a dictionary is. Let's start with the letter A and start reading the, the A words to you. What I really want is a big picture. So I'm going to walk you through in about 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, the whole process from building a schematic, doing a layout, generating the output files, and going to a website and buying a circuit board. So you're going to see the whole process end to end. And you're going to have 100 detailed questions that I'm going to not answer because I want to get through that whole process. And I'm happy to take a few questions, but we're going to then come back and we're going to do it all over again. And the second time through, we can take it slower. And in that case, what I'm going to do is use as an example the Bench Duino Expansion Board project. So I think it was uh, Paul or Mark who mentioned that they would like to build an expansion board. And how do you do that? And, and so we're going to do a second pass through the process uh, for, with that particular uh, board in mind, and we'll make up some circuit uh, as we go. And so hopefully uh, in that second pass, you know, you can ask more questions and, and whatnot. So um, even though I'm saying please don't overload the first part with a lot of questions, put questions in the chat, and, and I, it's fun for me to answer some questions as we go through that part as well. That way I also know that you're all still there and you're not just putting up an image of yourself, you know, and, and you've left the, left the room. 
So, um, so you know, some questions are fine. So that's the that's the general agenda for today. Uh, there are a bunch of terms that I I want to briefly mention. Uh, one of the challenges with any technical topic is there's a bunch of lingo, and we all take that lingo for for granted. So you know, when you call your wife on the cell phone and say, "What's your QTH?" you know what that meant. But I'm you know, well, she probably does too at this point. But if you, you told that to your dentist, they wouldn't know what you're talking about. So in PC board layout, there's a lot of uh, vocab, but there's maybe you know, half a dozen words that you really need to know what they are. And so I thought I could quickly walk through them now and because uh, I'm gonna use them during this session. So when we talk about doing a design, uh, we talk about doing schematic capture. Everybody knows what schematic is. And the objects that go on a schematic page are symbols. They're graphical shapes that represent a logical uh, image of what that part is. And then there's a footprint, and that goes in the layout view. The layout view is the physical design part of the board layout software. And the footprint is the combination of, of solder pads that go together with that component. So if you think about like a transistor, a transistor's got three pins, and so the footprint of a transistor is going to have three pads. It'll have three holes or three surface mount spots where the pins of that part go. So the footprint really refers to the physical image on the layout. Trace is obvious. That's a, a metal trace that goes between pins. That's the wiring between the different components. And um, one term you'll hear a lot is via. What's a via? A via is a pathway between layers of a circuit board. So if you think about the simplest circuit board in the world would have all the traces on the bottom and the parts on the top. And, uh, and a lot of cheap products are built that way because it's cheaper to have one layer of copper instead of two or four or eight or however many. Um, if you have a multi-layer board, let's say two-layer board, where you have copper traces on the top and the bottom, you need to connect those two layers together at some point. One way to do that is you have a, have a component whose pin, like a through-hole component, the pin goes through, and you solder it, and that hole is plated, and so the hole fills up with solder. So there's a connection between the top and the bottom, but that presumes you had a part with a lead that will go through that, that hole. Now, a via is essentially a hole that's plated that goes between two layers to form a connection. So you can go from the top layer to the bottom layer or whichever layers you're talking about. So it sounds like an exotic term. All it means is it's a connection between layers. And I'll show you plenty of examples of that. What's a layer? So if you look at a circuit board, a circuit board is typically built out of a piece of uh, epoxy fiberglass as the carrier, the insulating material. And there is at least a layer of copper metal on the bottom. Often there's a copper layer on the top. And in, in ham radio hobby projects, maybe even copper layers in the middle that are insulated from one another. And that gives you more layers to route more traces. And so the more densely you pack a component or a board of components, um, the more layers you have, the, more, uh, your, the better your chances are of being able to route all these connections together. Uh, you would never go to a multi-layer board if you could avoid it because they're more expensive. Now today, for building ham radio hobby projects, the cost of doing a four-layer board or a two-layer board or a one-layer board is almost insignificant. So uh, we, we're, we've gone through this revolution in cost to bring the cost of doing this stuff down so much that you can do a four-layer board for, you know, 30 bucks. I mean, it's not, it's not an exotic thing by any stretch anymore. So the layers refer to the layers uh, physically of the, um, of the circuit board. So you might have fiberglass with a metal layer on top, which is your traces. On top of that, you might have a solder mask, which is that typically that green covering that covers over the traces. On top of that, you might have a um, um, silk screen, which is the printing. So when you look at a board and it says U1 is a 7805, that ink that's printed there, that's the silk screen, just like on a t-shirt. It, it just means it's the printing. It means nothing electrically. It's just whatever you, you know, cosmetically put on the board so you know like what the connector is or you know, your, your name or whatever goes on there. And then the last thing that I'll mention is uh, Gerber files. So we all know Gerber because of the baby food, <laughs> but there's another Gerber. Uh, there's a, a Gerber photo plotting uh, company from like 40 years ago. So Gerber made these big machines that would take a file of data and plot that data uh, on a piece of uh, paper. And th that would basically, you would tell it where each of the holes go and where all the traces get routed. 
And so Gerber defined what that file format is. And so if you wanted to fabricate a board, you would send a set of Gerbers or a set of Gerber files to, a, uh, to the fab, the, assembly, the place they make the board, and they would put that uh, file into the Gerber photo plotter system and it would create the, the lithography uh, image for that, that layer of your, uh, of your circuit board. So anyway, we just refer to those as Gerbers. What are the Gerbers? The Gerbers are all the files that is the final output of the layout tool that you send to the, or the fab house to fabricate the circuit board. So um, is, are there any other terms that people have run into that we should briefly touch on? Nope, good, all right. So, so uh, let's, let me just show, share a couple more slides then we'll get right into it. So uh, let me talk about the flow we're gonna walk through in uh, the next 20 minutes. So there's kind of an end-to-end -end flow the first time through. So the first thing you do is you set up your libraries because when you're building a circuit board, you ideally would like to have all the parts that you're gonna use have the symbol for that part and the footprint for that part exist already in the software. One of the advantages of the popular software platforms like Eagle or other ones that are out there is that they tend to have large libraries of components because if they don't have a library of parts, then every time you go to design something, you're gonna to have to create the component view as well as build your circuit. Now, it's not that difficult to make a component, but if you have 20 different kinds of parts in your circuit, you don't want to make all these 20 parts from scratch. It's much better if you can open up a library, grab the part, and then drop it on the schematic. And I'll show you how to do that. So in order to give you the best running start at success, you you can use the libraries that come with the software. Uh, Eagle, for example, comes with a ton of libraries. And for most people, that's all you ever need. It turns out that there are other libraries that are very handy for hams and other hobbyists because they tend to have components that we tend to use in our projects. And there's links uh, in the document here to libraries from SparkFun, from Adafruit, and from Seed Studio. And uh, I have my own library that I've built a bunch of parts uh, into myself for a variety of reasons. And I'm happy to share you, with you my library. And when you install the software for Eagle, for example, all you need to do with a library is drop a file into a folder. And uh, then you, when you bring up the tool, it'll either recognize it automatically or you click a dot to turn it on and now you've got the library. So it's quite trivial. Okay, so then doing a design, you basically capture the schematic diagram with the graphical editor. And there's, there's always two views to a board design. There's the schematic view, the logical view, if you will, and there's the physical or layout view. And um, the thing that's really important about a professional piece of PC board design software is the notion of, of real-time connectivity in a term that they call correct by construction. What that means is that when I go into the schematic editor, when I drop a part in the schematic, a, the physical part instantly pops up in the layout editor. If I have two parts in the schematic and I draw a line between two of the pins, in the layout, you'll see a line immediately draw between the two pins in the physical world. Uh, this is done for a couple of reasons. Number one is it's to make sure you get it right. So if, if there's a connection on the schematic, there will be a connection in the physical layout, so you can't miss it. So that's pretty fundamental, right? Um, so it's just much better. If you look at cheap software in the past, you, you would have like a piece of drafting software and drafting software, you can draw a schematic, but it's just an image. It, it, there's, no, there's nothing underneath it. In a PCB design tool, when you draw a schematic, you're starting to build a database of connections between the points uh, that are connection points on the schematic. And again, we'll run through all that. Once you connect all your schematic components and you tr uh, lay out all the traces, then uh, what you're gonna do is run a last minute check called a design rule check. Design rule checks will, will check your physical design to make sure it meets the, the requirements uh, of the uh, fab house. And then you press a button to generate the Gerbers, the output files, and then you go to a website and you upload those. So we're gonna walk through that whole process. Uh, the rest of the document here, I won't walk through it, but uh, has all the links to various libraries and other configuration files uh, that we're gonna talk about. So let's just hop right into to doing some design work. Okay, so I'm going to be showing you uh, Eagle. This, this happens to be Eagle version 6.6. .6. Currently, the latest release is 9.6. Uh, 
And uh, I, I can show you that also. The, the, the features I'm gonna show you in the version six software are all in the latest version. And the latest version has a bunch of advanced features beyond that. So one of the things that, that happened after uh, Autodesk bought Eagle some few years ago is they put a lot of, uh, of money into accelerating the feature set in the software. So it's, uh, it, there's a lot of really great new features and we don't need to talk about any of them today because they're, they're like power steering, more advanced features. We're just gonna talk about the basics. And so you can even use an old version of Eagle if you happen to have a friend that has an old version or, or uh, use the old free version. That's what I'll show you here. Um, the reason that I use Eagle is because uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's very popular. When, I'm, when I look at um, examples of other circuits on the web, I can always find examples in Eagle. So for instance, if, um, if I go to SparkFun and I look at any of their breakout boards, they publish all their breakout boards in Eagle format. And e that's a proprietary format. So it's not like there's a universal format for this. So there's a, you know, dozens of PC board layout tools and they don't publish the boards in all of them. They publish the boards typically in Eagle and sometimes you'll see it in Altium and sometimes you'll see it in KiCad. Uh, KiCad is, the, um, is an open source, it's the best open source free PCB design tool out there today. So uh, one of the questions I get asked a lot is which tool should I use? So the answer is uh, for hobby use, the only answer is KiCad or Eagle. And the reason is because those tools have all the features that you need. They have all the libraries you're going to need. They have uh, all of the, uh, the, the fabrication house cam file support. I mean, believe me, it's the low path to success, low, low, low probability of failure if you go down that path. Um, I think if I were starting from scratch and I uh, wanted the cheapest possible solution, I'd go with KiCad because it's, it's free and you know, it's, it's not a commercial thing. Uh, Eagle has a free version. There are limits. You can only have a couple schematic pages and a couple layers and up to about 12 square inches, which is plenty big for a lot of our ham projects. So I think for most people, it doesn't really matter. Um, I, I generally suggest you use the one that your friend uses so that you can uh, exchange files. And, uh, you know, it's like, it's like anything else. You know, the best thing is the one your buddy has because, you know, at the end of the day, they're kind of all the same, at least in, the, in a certain uh, category. So uh, the reason why I'm showing Eagle is because I know it. I don't know KiCad. I, I do know Eagle really well. So that's what I show in. We happen to have, of course, Eagle or Autodesk is a sponsor of our podcast. So this is not meant to be a, a, a total shill job <laughs> for, for Autodesk. Although I must tell you that the guys there, like Jorge, who's their support guy, they're wonderful. Um, they're super responsive. They're just, they're just great. Um, so I, I have a lot of good things to say about them. Uh, but the concepts I'm going to show you are equally applicable, regardless of uh, whether you use uh, KiCad or, or Eagle. The commands are just different and the buttons are just different. That's about it. So let's get into it. So when, when you launch Eagle, uh, you do see this navigation pane that shows up. And you can see here, for example, um, up at the top before I open anything up, I could uh, manage libraries, design rule files, user programs, which are little macro um, subroutines I could run to do automated tasks. So I can run scripts, similar idea. Uh, cam jobs, the cam jobs are the, the executable that generates the Gerber files that goes to the fabrication house. And lastly, our projects, which is your design. So the two things that you touch mostly are libraries and projects. Um, so if I take a look at libraries, for example, I have two folders. I have the LBR folder, which is the default uh, that comes with um, Eagle. And then I have the GZ libs folder, which is the libraries I added to the system. So if I open up the, uh, the default uh, library here, so you can see that, you can see that uh, on the screen, there's like, what is this, like 50 plus libraries. And that, that takes us down through the letter C. <laughs> so there's a, there's a lot, you get all these libraries with the software. So odds are pretty good that if you need a part, it's probably in here. Uh, if you picked any one of these, like, oh, I don't know, let's pick um, uh, Murata filter library. If we open that up, then here's a couple of parts that are in there. If we go to something like a uh, resistor library, then holy cow, uh, there is a ton. There's a ton of parts. 
And, um, and by the way, uh, when you talk about a discrete component like a resistor, in a library, you don't have a specific library element for every value of a resistor. So, you know, resistors come in like 100 standard values from one ohm to 10 mega ohms. So if there's 100 different common values of resistors, you don't have 100 resistors in your library. You have one of a certain size, like you have one quarter watt through hole resistor. And then you put an attribute on that resistor called value where you tell it this is a 10K. So the symbol is the same. Uh, so that doesn't junk up the, the library. So if we were going to take a look, for example, here, sorted alphabetically, the capacitors are at the top of this here. I don't know why it's in the resistor library, but okay. So let's see. Um, you know, if you, if you pick any one of these, it brings up a lot of other parts. We'll, we'll kind of walk through this in the editor. But this is where you manage the libraries. Uh, we're not going to do a lot, lot with that at the moment. So let me shut off the libraries, and we'll go into our projects. And in particular down here, uh, I've got a project uh, folder here called voltage regulator. So I thought uh, the, the example I want to do is just a simple uh, linear voltage regulator circuit that everybody would use. So I would uh, click on that folder, right click on it, and I'm going to say we're creating a new project. Uh, I right click on it again and say I want to create a new schematic. So when I say create a new schematic, now I get my schematic editor window. And if you take a quick look around, you see a bunch of icons. And uh, most of these icons are really simple to understand. Uh, you tend to use about half of these a lot. And I'll explain what they are as we go through this. So what you see along the top are uh, obvious things like file save, uh, this little weird green icon that's running your cam files. This next one switches between layout and uh, schematic. Then a couple of these are used to run macros, zooming in and out. And then down along the left-hand side is the palette of commands to pull parts out of the library, stitch them together, delete them, rotate them, et cetera. And so I'll show you um, the more useful ones there. So um, I'm going to uh, make this window smaller. I'm gonna get rid of the uh, master window. So I'm gonna keep my schematic window and uh, put it here on the uh, left-hand side. And then I'm gonna click this uh, fifth icon along the icon bar here, uh, which opens up the layout view. And when I do that, it says, do you wanna create a layout from this schematic? And I say, yes, I do. And since there's no components, uh, the board is blank. Uh, so all it does is it draws the outline of the circuit board for me. And I can change that uh, dimension, of course. So I have no components and I have nothing in my layout. So right now, these two files, uh, if you looked in your folders, you would see two files. You would see a file called whatever name dot sch and a file called something dot pcb. Those two files go together. Whenever you edit one, you have to have the other one open because if you don't, you'll get inconsistencies and you're in deep trouble. So you always want to have the schematic and the layout at the same time. You don't have to look at them at the same time, but they have to both be open at the same time. So I'm going to start doing my, uh, my little uh, voltage regulator. So uh, everybody knows uh, like what a 7805 is, right? So it's the most common regulator on planet Earth. So I'm going to pull one of those out of the library. So I go over here to the palette. You see a little symbol here that looks like a little logic inverter. It's kind of tiny where my arrow is. So I click on that and that brings up my libraries. Now there's, there's tens of thousands of parts that I'm loading right now. So the first time you do that, it takes a while to load them all up. And so here's that big list of libraries. If I know what library I wanna pluck that part from, I can go in here and say, well, let's see, uh, here is um, VREG. That's a voltage regulator library. I'm going to click on that. And wow, look at that. Here's a bunch of voltage regulators. And I'll just go to the top and I'll left click on 78LXX. And you can see over to the right, there's the schematic symbol and there's the footprint for that part. So a 78L something is a low power linear regulator. They're usually good to a couple hundred or 100 milliamps. And they're in a little TO92 um, kind of plastic package. Now, you'll see that that line is highlighted in blue. If I hit my down arrow, it'll go to the next part, and the next part, and the next one, the next one, the next one, the next one. So, uh, oh, here's 78XXL, and now the package is not that TO92, it's a TO220 package. That's the big higher current, um, you know, tabbed component, which is the one we're looking for. 
but I can continue down this list and see a whole bunch of other, you know, TO3 packages. And, and by the way, here's a TO220 package that's for vertical mounting. So this is the kind where you would, you would screw the tab to the chassis of the box for a heat sink. And, and the only thing that takes up room on the board is just the, the footprint. So I can keep uh, cruising down through this list uh, until I see the one that I want. Now, there's another way to get this too, which is let's say you know the part you want, uh, I can search for it. So uh, if I type 7805, oop, 8705, <laughs> let's try it again, 7805 and hit return. Now what pops up here at the top is it found three libraries that have instances of 7805s. So the SparkFun library has some, uh, my SRS library has them, and my backup library has them. So let's take a look at the SparkFun library. I'll click the little um, symbol, and it opens it up and says, oh, look, there's actually four in that library. So here's the first one. There's a TO220 horizontally mounted version. Here's another one that's just slightly different. Here's a vertical mounted one with an outline for a heat sink. And here's one that's in the TO92 package. So in this case, let's go with uh, this one here. So I'm gonna say great, enter. And so now you can see uh, the schematic symbol. Now it's highlighted, so when I, when I move my mouse, the symbol moves around. And if I roll my scroll wheel back and forth, it zooms in and out. So it's very easy to zoom in and move around and zoom out, it's very natural. And as soon as I'm happy with where it goes on the schematic, I hit the right button on the mouse and it's dropped the part on the, uh, on the schematic. If I wanted to put five of these on here, I would just keep dropping them on here and I could have as many as I want. I don't need that many. So I'm gonna go up here to the little uh, plus sign, that's the selector. Uh, that's, that, that'll be your, your friend, that's your favorite icon. Because when I right, uh, left click on that one, now I'm in selection mode. So Eagle is what's called a modal interface. What that means is that once you select a mode, every time you click with, with the mouse button, it does whatever that last operation was. So if you want to copy something or delete something or rotate something, whatever that operation was, every time you click the left or right mouse button, it'll do that same thing again until you go into a different kind of mode. So if I'm in uh, dropping component mode, uh, I'll stay in drop component mode until I change it. So if I'm gonna delete some of this stuff, I'm gonna come here to the big X. The big X means delete, so I click on that. You can see the X is highlighted. And so now I'm gonna hover over some of these components and left click on them, and I'm deleting those parts. So it's very simple. Now, what you didn't see is while I was doing this, something magical happened over in the layout. I'm gonna delete that part, so I have no parts today. Okay, I'm gonna go back to the schematic. I'm gonna bring up my library. I'm gonna, I'm gonna select the 78XX component and I'm gonna drop it, left click now. And you see how the part showed up on the right-hand side? And I just moved my mouse over to the other window and rolled the scroll wheel and then zoomed in on it. So it starts to populate components just off the uh, boundary of the board. Uh, let's, let's bring in, um, uh, some filter capacitors. So I'm gonna go back to my parts icon. Now I'm gonna go uh, type capacitor. That should bring up a few. <laughs> there's, lots, there's lots and lots of, of capacitor libraries. I'm gonna pick the first one under Adafruit. I'm just randomly picking that one to, to use. So there's a capacitor-us. By the way, there are different symbols uh, that are standardized for US. Uh, in the US we use commercial symbols and we use uh, military uh, DOD documentation symbols, they're a different nomenclature. And sometimes they're different than in other countries. So sometimes you'll see um, non-US ones, but anyway, let's go with US. So I'll open that up and oh my gosh, there's a ton of capacitors. I'll click on the first capacitor and you can see there's a, a, a non-polarized capacitor symbol and there's the footprint to the right-hand side. Now what you see on the footprint is the green part is the actual copper that will be exposed. That's the actual solder, solderable part on the top uh, or the bottom of the, of the board. Um, the, um, the yellow part here is the silk screen, so you see the outline of the component. The other graphics, like the line that's going through it and the crosshatch, those are on other layers. And I'll explain what I mean by layers uh, in the editor in a little bit, but just ignore that for the moment. And you'll see that on both the schematic and on the layout, there's two attributes. 
there is a name attribute and a value attribute, and you can set up your layout editor and schematics to have a variety of different fields that are attached to components. But for now, the, these are the defaults, and I'll explain how we use them in a sec. So um, if I kind of scroll down through the library uh, as I go one to the next to the next, you can see how the symbol stays the same, but the geometry of the footprint changes. See how you get big fat ones and all that? Um, and most of these you'll see in the little notation here, um, something about the geometry. So if we go back to the first one, you'll see uh, in the text there below the schematic symbol, it says, this is a capacitor, it's on a 2.5 millimeter grid, and the outline is 2.4 by 4.4 millimeters. Okay, if I go to the next one, um, next one, next one, then you'll see how it tells you what the geometry is. So um, you, you, you pick the, the package that you want. These are all through hole examples. Uh, there are, of course, surface mount examples down here. So you'll see that <clears throat> the schematics is the same, but the footprint changes. And um, the footprints always change in passives because of power handling, like a resistor, an eighth watt, a quarter watt, a half watt, a one watt, a five watt, all those resistors are physically larger because they have to dissipate more heat. And so that's why you have a zillion different um, shapes. For circuits that don't require handling a lot of current, you can use smaller footprint parts. That's perfectly fine. Uh, when, you, when you're dealing with higher power, then you sometimes you'll have to use higher, uh, larger components to, to handle it. So we're going to make a through hole part uh, or board to keep it kind of simple. So I want to have a polarized uh, electrolytic capacitor. So I'll go to C pole polarized US for US symbols. And so uh, here's surface mount ones. Uh, here are through hole ones. Now, how do you know which one of these to pick? <laughs> well, uh, first thing you do is look in your junk box and see what you got. And if you have 20 of them that are five millimeter pin spacing, then you look for the symbol that has a five millimeter pin spacing like this one here. Uh, so this is a small uh, diameter four millimeter can with a pin spacing of 5.05 .05 millimeters. If the can was much bigger, but still 5.08 millimeter, that's 0.2 inches. So you can see these caps are physically larger. Um, so, you know, get out your caliper, measure the pin width of the capacitor you've got, and then pick the symbol that cl most closely matches that. Now, the other thing you can do is you can go to your friendly distributor, like DigiKey, and you can say 10 microfarad capacitor, and search for that. And that'll come back with, with a big pile of capacitors. So uh, in this case, we're gonna go with a aluminum electrolytic capacitor. So an inexpensive power supply filter cap. And now in my component selector, I can give it a bunch of attributes. So um, I go into the capacitance uh, thing, cause that's the fundamental thing I'm looking for. So I'll select 10 microfarads. And let's, let's say this is a five volt regulator. I'm gonna put, I don't know, 10 volts in and five volts out. So I need something that's north of 10 volts. 16 volts is typical as a minimum. I'd probably go 25 just to be on the safe side. So I'm gonna select a 25 volt capacitor. So those are the two parameters that I've picked, 10 microfarads at 25 volts. And then I'm gonna to go to the lower left-hand corner and click the in stock button so that when you give me a list of parts, you've got them in stock. I don't wanna, they'll give me a million parts that are not in stock. That doesn't matter. I just wanna see the parts they got. I hit apply filters. And so now I get a big long list of many pages of capacitors. Now it shows me some that are um, cans like what I was looking for and some that are surface mount. And I could further uh, go to the more filters and I could give it some more details like I could give it a lead spacing up here. Lead spacing is the distance between the pins. So I can say, do I want um, 1.5 millimeters, two millimeters, 2.5, five millimeters? What kind of pin spacing do I want? So let's say we're gonna do, I'm just picking this one. Let's do five millimeter pin spacing. I'll apply my filter again. And, and so here's a subset of, of much fewer components. Now out of these dozen parts, which one of these should I pick? Well, if you look here at, uh, usually the next thing you look at is the price. <laughs> so uh, if you go over to the price column, there's an up arrow. If you click on the up arrow, uh, what it'll show you is the cheapest to the most expensive. 
okay, the first one that's the cheapest is uh, three cents per, oh, I have to buy 2,000. Well, that ain't gonna work. So if I kind of come down here, see where it says minimum quantity, as soon as I get below the high, high volume ones, now I get to the onesies. So if I pick this one down here, um, it's 22 cents for one capacitor, and they happen to have 3,400 of those in stock. Now, one of the reasons that I use DigiKey for the majority of my discrete, com or majority of my parts is they have a huge inventory, they are very fast in shipping, and they're perfectly happy to put a five cent resistor in a bag. <laughs> um, the, the only downside to DigiKey is that they are like list price. So if you buy one, one of these capacitors, let's take a look at this guy. I'm gonna go over here where the DigiKey part number is. By the way, that's what he looks like. And I hit the part number. Now I'm gonna get more detail. I have access to the data sheet. Uh, I have access to the, the specifications of the component and I have a pricing table. So if you look over in the pricing table, you can see where between one to nine capacitors, they're 22 cents a piece. If I go to 10 capacitors, they're 14 cents a piece. If I go to 100 capacitors, they're seven cents a piece. So I can look at this and think, all right, do I need one? Well, this is a universal part. If I need one today, you know, they're 22 cents. Geez, I, I might as well get 10. Because at 10, they're $1.47 for 10 of them. You know, that's the price of six or seven. I might as well get 10. So I would just buy 10 because I'm going to use these over and over and over again. Uh, in fact, for some parts, for I, I build so many projects. For me, I, I buy some of the stuff by the hundreds and thousands because, you know, I'll, I'll use them. Like a 0.1 microfarad capacitor, don't buy less than 100. <laughs> 440 nuts and screws, buy 1,000. <laughs> don't buy them here. I have other places to shop for those. Um, but if you really want to shop around, I guarantee you, you can find a capacitor with the same specs from some unreliable source for less money. But quite frankly, it's not worth saving five cents on a lousy capacitor. Uh, because in this case, uh, one thing I glossed over is the manufacturers that they stock on DigiKey are all good brands. So when you look at capacitors, for example, the one I picked is a Panasonic. Panasonic is one of the best capacitor manufacturers in the world. If you ever recap a, a PC's power supply, everybody tells you use Panasonic capacitor. I mean, it's, you know, they're good stuff. So, you know, life's too short to use crappy parts. So unless you have it in your junk box, my advice is you might as well just buy it here. So, so you would just add like, okay, I want 10 of these and just say add to cart. And so now that part is in my shopping cart. Uh, by the way, you can see I had some other stuff in my shopping cart already because it's 61 bucks. So <laughs> this is just yet another part. So now I know uh, what, what I need to know back to the layout. So let's go back to the schematic and, and, and the layout here. So I know that I'm going to use a capacitor that is uh, five millimeter pin spacing, and this one fits the bill. So I'm going to left click on that guy, double click on it, and there's my capacitor. And I'm going to put it right here uh, by the input of my voltage regulator. Okay, the last, uh, well, almost last thing I'm going to do, I want a, de a, a, a small decoupling cap. Uh, so I'm going to go back to that, um, the point one. Oh, there's my surface mount. Let's go up to the top. Okay, so here's a handy, handy part. Uh, this is like the typical dipped monolithic little yellow, uh, you know, point one microfarad decoupling cap. I'm going to click on that guy and I'm going to put one of those over here on the output of my voltage regulator. Uh, if I go back to, to DigiKey, I could do the same you know, same exact process. I would go in there, I would type uh, 0 0.1 microfarad capacitor and, you know, would go through the same process. Now, one of the things that I mentioned before is you don't have, for discrete components, you don't have um, one for every value. So what we're going to do here is we're going to go to this first cap, our electrolytic. I'm going to right click on it. And the first thing at the top of the menu says attribute. So if I click on that, I can assign various attributes to the part. One of the parts that's very, or attributes that's very common is a value. Value is where you put the analog discrete component value in, in uh, microfarads or ohms or whatever. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna click on this little thing that says value. Okay, when I left click on that, I get a little dialog box and I type uh, 10 microfarads, 10 UF. Now, this is a piece of graphics that's now on this instance of this part. To the electrical circuit, 
in the in this tool in the in the schematic editor in the layout the fact that i put 10 microfarads means nothing except if you look at the layout now that capacitor has the value sitting on it so that's kind of cool it, you see the reference designator reference designator is a fancy name for the part number so you know the first capacitor is c1 the second capacitor is c2 the software is smart enough to start incrementing from one so every time you put in a uh, inductor, it's L1, it's L2, L3. It's smart enough to do that by itself. And since we put this attribute of 10 microfarads, that shows up on the silk screen as well. If I come back to the schematic and I right click on it and I click on value, I get the dialog box and I say 22 microfarads, the layout instantly changes to reflect 22 microfarads. At this point, this 22 microfarad number is useful because I'll see that value on my schematic and I'll see that value silk screened on the circuit board. But if I get the circuit board today or tomorrow, I fab the boards, they show up tomorrow and I go to build it. And you know what? I never ordered those lousy 22 microfarad capacitors. I look in my junk box and I have a 47 mic capacitor that would fit in the holes and electrically that's just a big filter capacitor. So who cares? I could put in a 47 mic capacitor and it doesn't matter. So there's nothing about the circuit board layout tool that, that you create a problem. Uh, the only time that's a problem is if you ever do a simulation of a circuit, then that's, uh, those numbers are then piped over to a simulator. And so that would give you an erroneous result. But for purely making circuit boards, the value is only a documentation thing. It's, it's nothing more significant than that. Okay, so, so we've got our first cap. We're gonna go to capacitor two, right click, value 0 0.1. Um, if, if I thought later on, oh, you know what? Uh, I want more uh, input filtering. I could come up here to the upper, uh, I wanna duplicate that cap. I come up here to the, the, the icons, right next to that little uh, plus sign, there's a little symbol that has like two little guys. That's the uh, copy command. So I left click on the copy command. I, I click on the capacitor symbol. I move my mouse around, I have another capacitor, I put it next to it, hit the left button and it drops it down there. So now I have two electrolytic capacitors and lo and behold, there's the second capacitor called C3 with a value of 22 microfarads. Um, okay, now what we're gonna do is uh, we're gonna add one last component. I need a way to get signals onto and off the board. I could put a connector on here, I could put a solder pad on here, whatever I wanna use. So uh, we'll make it simple. I'm gonna just put a solder pad. So I'll go to my components again, come down to the search thing, and I'm gonna type solder pad, hit return, and oh look, there's no solder pads. How about that? Well, how else could we spell solder pad? I don't know. Uh, we could use a wild card. So an asterisk is a wild card in naming for parts. So I'm, I don't know if it's solder dash pad, solder space pad, solder whatever. So I'm gonna stick a asterisk between solder and pad. So give me everything that's solder something pad and then hit, hit enter and uh, nothing happens. Well, that's not good. All right, let's go back to the beginning and put an asterisk in the beginning of that and see what we get. Oh, look, solder pads. <laughs> so the tip here is if you're searching for a part and you don't know what to call it, start putting in asterisks in the title, in the name, uh, and until you get too many, then you can like hone in on it. So here, uh, my, my library popped up and there's, um, oh here, it's a power pole solder pad, which is not really what I'm looking for. So I'm gonna stick an asterisk at the end of the line and oh, look, there's a bunch more solder pads um, also from my library. So um, the name of, the, of, of these indicates the, um, uh, the hole size. So I click on one of these and there's a, there's a solder pad and I go down the list and there's more and more solder pads of various sizes, surface mount ones, uh, through hole ones. So I'm just gonna pick the first one here, a, um, uh, this one, double click on it and there's a solder pad. Uh, by the way, when that part comes in, I didn't like its orientation. So I wanna rotate that part. While the part is live and I'm dragging, I'm not holding anything, I'm just dragging the mouse around. If I click the right button, each time I click it, it rotates at 45 or 90 degrees. So if it came in like, uh, like this and I wanted to have it like this, I just click it to the right and it rotates it around. Then I decide where to put it. How about here? I left click it and now it deposits it there. Since again, modal, I'm still in component mode. So I have another image. So I, I, I want another one on this side. So this is 
voltage input and ground. And then on my output, I'm going to rotate it around, drop an output here, and drop a, a ground pin here. So these are all the pins that I need for my circuit board. So uh, here you, you see all that stuff. So there's our solder pads and our caps and our voltage regulator. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to stitch the, um, the components together. To do that, I'm going to use a, what's called a net. Now, in circuit board uh, schematic editor tools, the, the lines between devices are not just graphical shapes on the schematic. They actually build the connectivity database. Every component has somewhere between one and N connection points. So if we zoom in on this voltage regulator, for example, there is a connection point at the, uh, at the end of the input. Oops, let me get rid of that. Um, so here, this is a connection point, this is a connection point, and this is a connection point. The rest of this shape is just graphics. I could have drawn a Pac-Man with, with three of these connection points and it would work exactly the same. And what happens is each of those three connection points on the schematic maps to three physical pads on the device. In the database, each one of these connection points has a name. In the, in the component library, each one of these pads in the corresponding footprint has a name and you ma match them together. So you might call this in, ground, out. These pins would probably be called in, ground, out. And that's how the, the the connection is made between the symbol and the, and the footprint. Now you don't need to do that unless you're building your own parts, but that's what's going on. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stitch together um, the circuit. So on my, on my um, uh, tray over here of icons, you'll see that there's one that's fourth from the bottom called net, N-E-T. Okay, a net means it's a electrical connection that's in the database. It's not just an arbitrary line. This one over here that's on the left-hand side, that's uh, six, uh, uh, what, seven from the bottom, that, uh, that's a wire, uh, but you really want the net. So I'm gonna click on net, and now I'm going to put my cursor on the tip of this point here. I'm gonna click the left uh, mouse button. When I move the cursor away, look what happens. It's drawing a line, uh, and my finger's off the mouse button. Uh, in fact, it's drawing, uh, it's drawing a net. It's a, it says, I have an electrical connection on this point here, and I'm going to connect it to something else. So let's connect it to the input of my voltage regulator. So I click left again. I move it to the end of the part here, and I click it again. Now, do you see what happened down here? Um, out of nowhere, a little yellow line showed up that connects that solder pad to that solder pad. And it did that because it understands that these are pins and that that's a net that's connected. If I go to the X for delete, if I click on X and then I click on the net to delete the net, look what happens, that line goes away. So I'm gonna go back and draw my, uh, my net here, left click, and then I'll go to the end of the existing little net, left click, and now the connectivity is established. And you'll notice if I go to the layout editor and see there's a very similar set of icons in the palette uh, that have essentially the same features. If I collect the, connect the selector icon, this little plus symbol, I come over to my solder pad, I left click on it just like I would have clicked on a, a schematic symbol, and it highlights that part. And as I move my mouse around, it's going to let me put that part wherever I want it. The, George, the, question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, it's Marty. Um, do you have? Do you need a separate net for each line? In other words, uh, the connection going across from uh, solder point one and is is one net. And the one going down is a second net. Yes. And the one going to the right is a third. Yes, that's correct, Marty. In fact, there's there's a really interesting thing that happens what we'll, that we'll get to in a moment here. So uh, yes. So let, let's finish off this schematic. Then I want to show you how clever these nets are. So to make this a little more drafting appealing, I'm gonna go into the selector mode. I'm gonna move this guy up uh, and drop it. And then I wanna move this vertex here. So I go to that point, I left click it, I drag it up and I click it again and I drop it. So it cleans up the schematic. Uh, now I, for the output, I'm gonna do a little shortcut. I'm gonna click on that output solder pad. I'm gonna just come over and touch the pins together. Left click, oops, I didn't get to do it. Uh, come over, touch the pins, left click it and then drag it away and look what happened. It knew that when you put two connection dots or connection points on top of each other, that it, those are connected. 
And just like here, when I drew this manually, it retains the schematic connectivity. It created the connectivity over here. So now I'm going to finish off the, um, the schematic here in kind of an in interest of time. So uh, I, I'm going to have this as my ground pin. So I'm going to connect those two together. And uh, to your point, Marty, let me, let, me, uh, let me go over to the layout here. Um, so here's our circuit board. Uh, we're going to change the size of the circuit board. So the circuit board is, is uh, drawn on a grid. So I'm going to turn on the grid. I'm going to type grid space on and hit return. And so it turns on the grid. Now I need to set my grid. So I go up to view, grid, and I'm going to change it um, to, oh, that's all right, 0.05. Let's change it to 0.025 uh, inches is my grid. And when I zoom in, I can now see that grid. So um, I, I want to make the board smaller. So I'm going to, I'm in the selector mode. I come over here to the uh, top of the board. I left click on it and now I've grabbed the top of the board and I can make that board any kind of shape that I want. Uh, I just want to make it shorter. So I'll just drag it down to here and left click. Then I'll grab the right side, left click, drag it in and left click. Now, if I knew exactly how big I wanted it, I could right click on it and I can go to properties and I could change those numbers and just type them in here. So I can type in a precise geometry of the board, which you would normally do. So now I'm gonna start placing my, my parts. So I'm gonna to go to um, the big voltage regulator. I'm gonna bring it over here and drop it in there. I'm gonna bring my solder pad input pad here. I'm gonna bring my solder pad output over here. I'm gonna bring my input capacitor up here and uh, gee, I wanna rotate it. So while it's live, I right click it once, twice, and again. Uh, to put the uh, positive side up. I then come over and left click this guy, drag him up, uh, right click once, twice, three times. I now have two. I'm gonna put it side by side. I wanna grab my regulator, move him up a little bit, take my output cap, bring him over here, left, uh, right click once to rotate him. Then I'm gonna bring my ground solder pads over to here. Now, uh, if you notice currently, the connectivity between the schematic and the layout is identical. There are exactly three connections that are going on. Solder pad to input, output to solder pad, and two solder pads together. Now, each of these nets in the database has a name. That's how the software knows that, what the difference is. But you don't see a name here. Um, th there's an a attribute called label. If, if I go to this uh, first net and I right click on it, and I click the word label with my, with my right button, or my left button, you'll see that it brings up a little uh, word here. It says N$1. Okay, if I go over, it, again, modal, I'm, in, I'm now in label mode. If I come over to the right and I left click on the right net, guess what? It shows me N$2 and I can put it wherever I want. And you see this little connector line? That just tells you that that, that name is associated with that wire, that net. So I'm gonna put it here and left click to deposit it. And then down at the bottom, I'm gonna do the same thing left click on it, oh, that's called N$3, son of a gun. So the software will incrementally call the nets, net one, net two, net three, net four, net five. Now that's fine, there's nothing wrong with that, but for documentation purposes, what we generally wanna do is explicitly give those nets our own name uh, for some other good reason. So if I come up here to net one, if I right click on it and I go to name, I bring up the name dialog, there it says N$1, I wanna call it something else, I wanna call it in. Now, a name could be any combination of letters and numbers, and you can even use some punctuation. So you can use a plus sign, a minus sign, and some other stuff too. Uh, you can use underscores or dashes. Uh, most of those are legal characters. So uh, I'm gonna call this guy out, and I'm gonna call this guy ground. Now, it could be GND or G or GD or dig digital ground or whatever you want. It doesn't really matter. We can call those nets anything we want. So you'll see on the right-hand side, everything looks exactly the same as it did before. I've just named those nets explicitly, the names I wanna give them. Okay, so now we get to um, the interesting uh, thing that, that you were kind of pointing at, um, Marty. What happens if you give an, a two nets the same name? Um, what do you think is gonna happen? Softball question. Would reject the uh, identical name. Ooh, fail. <laughs> okay. They become the same. Exactly. They become the same. Gold star. Let's do that. Uh, let's go over here to the output, and I'm going to right-click on it, go to the name thing, 
and it comes up and says out. I'm going to type in and hit return. Uh, then it says connect out and in. <laughs> Are you really sure you want to do that? Yeah. Okay. So the schematic looks the same, right? You still have these two lines. They're now just both called in. So that's logically correct because in the schematic, any two objects with the same name are electrically connected. They don't have to be physically touching on the schematic. As long as they have the same, the nets have the same name, they are electrically connected. Now let's look at our layout. What happened over here? See the tiny little airline that's now connecting those two together? Now they're connected together. You just With, shorted the input and the output. Exactly. And, and this is called a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> that's the technical name. If I wanted to undo that, I could come back here and right click. Let's zoom in on this guy. I can right click on the output, go to name and call him out. And magically, the two pins are now no longer connected together. So this is the difference between a drafting tool and a schematic editor, because the schematic editor understands connectivity and understands the, the database. What's interesting about this, and a technique you'll see a lot, I'm going to just throw one more part temporarily here. I'm going to just arbitrarily um, uh, pick, pick a part. Let's do... Go back to the top. Here's our big list. Let's go in here and pick a, uh, I don't know, a 75, 170, 75, 164. All right, there's a integrated circuit. Okay. Um, on this integrated circuit, if, if I draw a net on this pin here, right now, I don't know what it's called. I hit the uh, right button, I hit label, and now I see, oh, we're back to N1 because we don't have an N1 anymore, right? So that part is now sitting here off the board. It's not, that net doesn't go anywhere. So there's no airline to show the connectivity. If I come in here and I, if I call this, uh, change the name of this signal to in, you want to connect N1 to in? Yes. Now, see, I have an airline that goes from that pin on the, on the chip over to uh, this net up here. So you'll find this a lot uh, in very complicated circuit boards. It's, it's easier to draw a schematic where all the connectivity is represented by lines on the schematic, like good drafting practice. The problem is that a lot of modern circuits have potentially hundreds of connections. And if you actually drew a connection wire between every one of those pins on the schematic, it would be impossible to read it. And so one of the techniques that's used is you'll often see that um, you'll have two nets on the schematic with the same name and that, that the designer knows that means they're connected together. This is also a potential disaster if you're not careful <laughs> because if you accidentally call two things the same name, the system won't do it. it. It won't automatically do it. But if you explicitly override it and call two things the same thing, it'll be connected on the layout. So you wanna be careful about that, but it's a very convenient way to have schematics that look very simple and elegant, but that are describing very complicated uh, connectivity. Okay, so let's get rid of uh, this chip and its net, and let's finish off the schematic. So I'm gonna go pick the net icon on the left. I'm gonna to go to the top of the capacitors. I'm gonna left click on the top and then bring it up to the top and do a, do a left click. I'm gonna do the same thing over here. I'm gonna connect the capacitors to ground. And then I'm going to come to my little output cap, hook that guy up. And then I'm going to go to the ground pin on the, the voltage regulator and hook him up to ground. I don't like how it's in the middle of the word. I'm going to left click, select the word ground, click it again. I'm going to move that around over to here. And uh, there we go. Uh, by the way, you can see how everything got built up over on the right. So that, that's our circuit. Um, one of the things that I want to point out is that the, the tool follows proper drafting technique and shows you a three-way connection with a solder dot. If you see wires that uh, overlap each other, without a solder dot, they're not connected. So if, if I, um, let's say I deleted this wire here, uh, let's say I, I had you know, some net here and then I connected this one uh, to here, for example, where these two lines cross, this is not a connection. So one of the things that you'll see in extremely poor schematics is this is a four-way connection. Um, good schematic drafting practice is you never have a four-way connection under any circumstances. If you, if you look at uh, the way you do documentation for military standard documentation, there is a rule in some book somewhere 
that has a number that says thou shalt never have a four-way connection. The only legal connection you can ever show on a, on a military standard schematic is a three-way connection, even if that means you have to do something that looks kind of ugly like this. Uh, that is a legal connection. Uh, anything that passes over it is not a legal connection. And there's, there's a good reason for this. Anybody want to hazard a guess why? Some of us are old enough to remember uh, photocopier machines or blueprint machines. If, if I have a, a, a four-way connection with a solder dot and I make the fifth generation photocopy of that image, that, photo, that dot goes away. <laughs> So if you see three wires going together with no dot, that's a connection. If you see four wires going together, that is not a connection. So um, you, you can actually do that in Eagle, uh, which I hate. So this is actually a legit drawing in Eagle, but I, don't ever show me a schematic with that. You'll never hear the end of it. Okay, so rant over. Let me get rid of this extraneous junk. I'm just going to delete and left clicking it. I'm gonna go back to net. I'm gonna grab the end of this net and connect it to the ground. Yes, please connect it and we're done. So there's our schematic, schematic is done. Now let's go to the layout. I'm gonna zoom in on the layout. We're not gonna change the connectivity at this point. We're just gonna move stuff around. So every one of these parts in Eagle has, you'll see a plus sign, that very thin little plus, that is the anchor. If I wanna move that part, if I go into the little plus sign and I approach that little anchor, that's where the editor is gonna look at my cursor and say, oh, what's the closest thing? So when I left click it, I've now picked that capacitor. If I went over here to the edge and click, do the same click, it won't find it. I have to get close enough in order for it to find it. And so that's, that's the graphical thing that the editor is gonna grab onto when it, uh, when it sees the click. So uh, just for uh, um, cleanliness, I'm gonna just adjust these a little bit. Um, now over here, take a look at what's happening with this capacitor. So we could wire this up and it would be fine, but it's kind of ugly. So I'm gonna rotate the capacitor. So I'm gonna hit the plus sign again, go over here, I'm gonna left click the, the anchor in the middle. It highlights the part. I right click the mouse once and again, and now it rotates the part. I click the left side of the mouse button, it drops it. And so now everything looks pretty good. So I'm gonna start routing. So are there any, any questions at this point before I wrap up? Uh, the routing will take just a minute. So I assume the routing is just basically to, to make the, uh, the traces look a little cleaner? Yeah, so what you're seeing right now are called airlines. This is just a logical representation of what's connected electrically. But if you went to fabricate this board right now, you wouldn't have any traces on the board. So we have to lay down the traces next. Hey, George, you had, uh, you had picked a kind of a random grid that we're seeing here. Yeah. Is there a manufacturing grid or a grid that the PCB manufacturer dictates that you need to snap these two? Or yeah, that that, that's a great question, John. So what you'll find is that for every board manufacturer, they will have a set of specifications that refer to the absolute limits. So what is the absolute finest pitch or distance that, that, they, that you can route a trace? What's the absolute smallest hole that you can drill? So as long as you, you stay away from, from those smallest units, then you're fine. So you can have, uh, so for parts placement, you can, you can be way off grid and, and the placement will be fine. Um, but you, you, for good hygiene, you wanna have a pretty standard grid. So what, what I use, uh, I change the grid as I'm doing the design, depending on what I'm doing. So generally speaking, when I'm placing components, I have a fairly coarse grid, something uh, like, uh, let's say grid, uh, 0.05. Um, so this is a fairly coarse grid. If I click on something, see how it jumps that unit. Um, if I were going to do a very fine pitch trace, then I would go to a finer grid. So uh, what you really want to do is you want to go in even um, divisions of a tenth of an inch. So typically that means 0.1 inches, 0 0.05, 0 0.025, 0 0.0125, 0 0.00625. So you keep wanting to cut them in half. As soon as you go off that, then things don't really line up properly. The tool will let you do it, but I, I don't recommend it. So stick to a, stick to a division of 0.1. Perfect, thanks. Um, so let's go ahead and, and, and uh, stitch these things together. So to wire them together, um, I'm gonna start down here at the ground side. I'm going to right click on this airline that goes between my ground pad and the capacitor. I right click on it, it lights up, and I get a little menu. So I'm gonna go down here to route. 
this is manually routing. We can auto route this, which means have the computer calculate and do the routing for us. But um, the auto routers on inexpensive design tools are awful. <laughs> if what's the difference between a thousand dollar piece of software or a free piece of software and a fifty thousand or a hundred thousand dollar piece of software? It's a better auto router. A really good auto router is worth its weight in gold, and usually they're used on very large circuits. Um, the auto routers you get for free or cheap, mostly you'll never use them. And it, it's sort of the way it is, but it's not a big deal. I'll show you what it looks like in a minute. So, uh, well, heck, let's just do the auto route now while, while we're at it. Uh, and then we'll do it properly. So the auto router is on the, uh, the, the second icon from the bottom. It says, uh, it has a little crosshatch here. I'm gonna left click on that. It brings up a dialog box where I could put a bunch of parameters in how I wanna run the router. So I can tell the router to put, um, let's say if I have two layers, top and bottom, I would tell it to route the north-south traces on the top and the east-west traces on the bottom, or I can give it all kinds of parameters. I'm going with the default here. So I'm gonna just say, okay, and there we go. It just auto-routed the circuit. So what you see here is uh, the blue traces. These are now no longer just logical airlines. These are the actual copper traces. The blue ones are on the bottom and the red ones are on the top. And there's a way you define that this is a two layer board or a four layer board somewhere else that we won't get into at the moment, but typically it's two or four layer. And you can see the router completed, except believe it or not, this stupid connection to the C2 is not technically difficult and why in the world it didn't do it is beyond me. So I'm gonna grab this capacitor, move it up a little bit and I could finish hand routing it. But instead of that, I'm gonna zoom out. I'm gonna go to the select box, this square on the left, I'm going to use my right cursor to select everything, and I'm going to uh, rip it all up. And so I'm going to say rip up all. Uh, oop, rip. Uh, I have a macro for that. Let me just load my macro. Uh, so I have a little macro here called uh, rip up all. Click on that. Rip it up. Yes. Everything goes back to airlines. Yeah, I, I take it that means there's not an undo function. Oh, there is. I just rip it up. Uh, you can rip up subsets of the whole thing. So let's rerun the auto router and see if this does any better job. Go. And oh, still didn't route it. So th this is even a worse example than I thought of. <laughs> this is a dumb thing it should be able to route. Now, if you're happy with the layout and you want to finish it off, we could route these last two traces. But um, we're going to ditch the, ditch the router. So I'm going to... I'm going to do an undo. So there's control Z. So we just did an undo. So I'm going to just route this thing by hand. And 99.9% .9 of the time, I do all routing by hand. So the way you route this is you right click on the, on the airline, you click the route button. And um, if you look on, above here, uh, there's a little blue square that says 16 bottom. And then there's little shapes here, right angle, a little uh, chamfered angle, another angle. These are the ways that the, that the router will behave. So right now I'm on right angle routing on the bottom layer, which means that all of the traces will be at right angles. And so you can see how the trace follows me around. Uh, you'll also notice that the airline, the connectivity, the yellow thing, it knows the closest connection point is here on this capacitor. But if I start routing over here, it says, oh, well, here's the closest connection point. And oh, no, here's the closest connection. Oh, no, here's the closest connection. So it's, it's smart that way, right? Um, and so let's say I, I just want to have one big trace that runs over to this pad over here in a nice straight line. I get over to the end and I left click it and it completes the route and now I have a trace. So that trace is, is electrically done. Now that copper is a certain width. If I right click on that copper and click on properties, it'll tell me what the width is and it's 0 0.016 of an inch. And uh, in this circuit, maybe that's adequate, maybe not. If you're not sure, you can use a, a trace calculator. You can find them on the web. I'm just gonna make it fatter. So I'm gonna pull this down and say, let's make it 0 0.032 inches. Click that, click okay, and that fattens up the wire. So if I fabricated the board today, I would have holes for all the components in one trace between these two. So I'm gonna finish this all off. So I'm gonna right click on this trace, hit route and bring it down here. I'm gonna right click on this trace, hit route and bring it down to here. Oh, by the way, look at that. Where my, where my capacitor got placed, the trace can't land in the middle of it. I need a finer grid. Grid space 0 0.0125. Now I have a much finer grid and now it'll be nice and straight. You'll see I put the airline or the, 
the thing over the end of the airline left click and now it's made. This one over here, I'm gonna route down to the bottom. Um, so these are all nice and, and, and square. What if I wanna go at a 45 degree angle? Uh, I can go up to the top here and I could, I could select the next one over uh, from the very upper left. See that little uh, 45? Now when I right click this trace and do route, well, guess what? It's now routing with a 45. So maybe I wanna come over at a 45 degree angle to this guy, and then I'll select this guy and route to the side, and then have this guy go up, maybe jog a little bit, have this guy come down here, this guy come down with a 45 to here, and have this guy come up like that. So I just routed with 45s. 90% of the time you route with 45s. Now I wanna make all these traces fatter, so I'm gonna go back to my selector, I'm going to draw a box around everything, and now I'm gonna type a command. This is a command line software, so you can use the UI or you can type a command if you remember. And there's a few commands that are very common, like um, change width to 0 0.04, enter. And now all these things are highlighted. What I do is I hold down the control key, I go over on any one of these traces and right click it, and all the traces that were highlighted are now fattened up. Now, one last thing we'll do is if I wanna move any of these items, let's say I wanna move this pad. If I come over here and select the pad and click it again, I can move the pad and the, and the, and the copper trace moves with me up to that last uh, joint there. So I can move it down to here and click it and there it is. On the newer versions of Eagle, they have a much more clever version of this. And if I grabbed a part like this integrated circuit, this voltage regulator, and I moved it around with all those traces, they would all move together and they would all stay at a certain distance apart. So the newer software does fancier things like that. You don't need that, but it's nice to have it. Okay, so our, our design is just about done. Uh, the last thing I'm gonna do here is, uh, before I'm gonna create the output file for this thing, uh, I want to clean up the silk screen a little bit. If I put these caps in here, they would cover up these uh, values. So I want to, um, I want to move that 22 microfarad wording away and maybe add some other labels. So that little piece of graphics is tied to that component. So if I grab that part and I move it around, that 22 microfarad label moves with it. Well, I don't want that. I want to break it apart. So what I'm going to do is go back to my palette here and there is a command over on the left-hand side called smash. So that's right in the middle here. If I left click on smash, and I come over to this part and I click on it at its anchor point, you'll see that this 22 microfarad label now has its own anchor point. This one does not over to the right. If I click on the middle of that capacitor, I get a little X on this 22 microfarad label. Now if I go back to the selector, the little plus sign, I can now come here, select just the text, and I could move it around, I can right click it to rotate it, and put it wherever I want, just like this one. I could bring it up here. I could also move the reference designator around and put them wherever I want. Uh, the last thing I wanna do is add some arbitrary text. So I'm gonna come over here to the T uh, icon, left click on T, I'm gonna type uh, input, hit return, and now I have text. Doesn't that look great? Uh, well, not really. <laughs> what would happen is it, it would print the word input in copper on the bottom of the circuit board, which is exactly not what I want. I want that to go on the silkscreen la layer because I want it to be printed in ink, not in copper. Now, this introduces a whole new concept, which is the layers in the database. So I mentioned before a circuit board has layers, a silkscreen layer, a solder mask layer, a copper trace layer, the uh, insulating fiberglass, and then all that again, copper silkscreen or copper solder mask silkscreen on the bottom. Those. Uh, eight layers of stuff in a two layer board are all separate layers, logical layers in the database. If I come over here on the upper left and I hit this icon that has a bunch of little squares on it, uh, when I do that, up pops a dialog box that shows you 256 layers in the database and which ones of the layers are turned on. Now this is, this is one of the things that is really useful to understand. So I wanna take a minute on this. When we built our schematic, in that symbol, in that, in that TO220 regulator symbol, we have a variety of things that are clustered into that symbol. We have an outline of the package, which we want as silkscreen, 
ink on the thing. We know where the drill holes are for the pins of the part. We know uh, the, the, the bottom copper layer and the top copper layer has those oval pads. We know a bunch of stuff, right? All of those different things I just mentioned are clustered together in this one part. Each of those pieces of data for that part is actually living in a different database layer. Okay, now if you go over and look on the left here, you'll see that some of these uh, layers, they're numbered one through 255. Some of these layers are highlighted in blue and some are not. The ones that are highlighted in blue are currently turned on. So if there's any data on that layer, we'll see it here. And you'll see the names of those layers to the right. So you'll see up at the top there, layer one is top, that, that's red, that's the top copper. Layer 16 is the bottom, that's the bottom copper. So if I turn off layer 16, guess what happens? I hit apply. I no longer can see layer 16, which is where my copper exists. So it's still in the database, but it's just not visible to me. So if I wanna turn that back on, I come back here, click bottom, apply, and then now I see my data, my, my copper. Now, when we go to the final step, which is to create the Gerber files, the Gerber files basically match the layers of the process that go to the fabrication house. So there is a piece of software in our set of rules that are run that says, take, the, take various layers in the database, take a set of those, and then export them in a certain format, Gerber format, and that's what goes to the fab. So when I, when I said uh, add this text, the last layer that I was playing around with was uh, layer 16, the bottom uh, copper layer. So that's what my text showed up in. If I want to actually bring in a uh, silk screen and put it on the top of the board, then that lives in, in the system on layer 21. So you'll have, I'm sorry, you'll just have to memorize these, but there's like 10 of them that you'll memorize and you'll be fine. You don't need to know 255, you only need to know 10, and they're clustered in top and bottom. There's like five you really need to know. So the silk screen on the top is in 21, the silk screen on the bottom is in 22. The names of components are on 25 and 26, the values of components are on 27 and 28, and um, vias are uh, on layer 18, solder pads are on 17, and copper traces are in one and 16 on a two layer board. Why they don't have them on one and two, uh, whatever. Uh, if you're doing a 16 layer board, you'd have one to 16 and these would be the extremes, that's why. So if you were doing a four layer board, you would have one, two, 15 and 16 and two and 15 are the two inner layers. It's just by convention. So if I wanna change this, uh, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go up, uh, I'm gonna do text again and uh, actually what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change the layer of this guy here. So I'm gonna right click on this piece of text, go to properties, and here it says what layer that data lives on. It's currently on bottom 16, the bottom uh, copper layer, and we wanna put it on the top. We wanna put it on uh, layer 21. And I'm gonna show you one idiosyncrasy of, of this tool that drives me nuts, but I wanna share it with you. So I'm gonna pull down this and I'm gonna, I'm gonna shove this data on another layer. I could put it on any data any layer I want. If I put it on layer one, it'll show up as copper on the top of the board. But the silk screen layer is 21 on the top. So I'm gonna click 21 and hit okay. So by the way, you see how the color changed from, from blue to white? Because white is how we show silk screen in the system. But you'll see it's still backwards. So if I right click on it and go to properties, um, I could uh, spin it around or mirror it uh, if, if I come in here and mirror it, and there's a mirror command, that's two little brackets next to each other below the plus sign. If I click mirror and I come over here and I click on it and it flips it over, it mirrors it and you think, oh my gosh, this is awesome. How easy is that? There's a gotcha. If I right click on it and look at the properties, guess what? It not only flipped it over, it moved it to layer 22. Why do you think it moved it to layer 22? The reason is that the system thinks if you have a piece of text on layer 21 and you flip it over, I think you're gonna to wanna to put it on the bottom layer because who wants text backwards? Unless you start with backwards text. So to fix it, we go in here and say, no, I want layer 21. Okay, so now it's on layer 21. So now when we fabricate our board, this will show up as white ink, as white ink on that circuit board. So I'm gonna grab it. I'm gonna bring it over here. I'm gonna right click on it to rotate it around and then I'm gonna drop it here, and now it'll look proper. 
Okay, uh, the last little thing on layers I want to share with you is layer 20. Layer 20 is called the dimension layer. That is the outside of your circuit board. So um, the thickness of the line is immaterial. So I always do change with zero, which means infinitely small. And I click that on these outer lines. That defines the edge of my circuit board. Now, if you wanted to have a, a, a notch on your circuit board, I could go in here and use the split command, just like I would split a trace. I could come in here and I could split uh, the, um, the edge of the circuit board like this. And when I fabricate this board, the board will have a notch in it just like that. So you can use this tool to make arcs. You could use it to cut out holes. You could use it like if you're doing an AC power supply and you have AC wires coming in and you want to air gap between the pads so you don't short anything out, you can route a channel between um, those pads. And you could do it. There's a couple ways to do it. This is you could make you could make a hole for the uh, for the magnet of a speaker, a little speaker. Yes, exactly. Okay. And the way I would do that is I would come here to my geometry tools. I would pick circle, come over here, set the center, and then set the diameter. And then if I uh, now it looks like a chunk of copper. If I right click on it, go to properties, I change the layer to uh, actually to milling, uh, which is a little trick. You go to uh, 46. Uh, if I change that to milling and say, okay, you don't see it here because probably milling is turned off. So I'll go back to my layers, turn on 46. See there it says milling. So now it'll be visible if I hit apply and there it is. So that's a, that's a milled out hole. So very handy. Uh, if you're just doing a hole, by the way, you can do a hole. You don't have to do milling. Uh, you could do a hole. There's a hole command that looks like a little bullseye. You click on the bullseye. You come over here. You, you drop where you want it. And then uh, you do right click on properties, bring up the properties, and you can say, how big do you want the hole to be? I want that hole to be uh, 0.2 inches in diameter. And there you go. Now you got a hole. So um, now what we're going to do is we're going to fabricate uh, this board. And, um, and of course, this is taking more time than I expected. <laughs> it's just the way it is. Uh, all right. The way we so, do it. <laughs> All right, so now how do we make a board? The first thing I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to save this thing because, you know, heaven help me if it, if it, if it, it doesn't uh, survive. So I'm going to do save as, and we're going to, we're going to call this um, uh, HRWB voltage regulator, rev1. Okay, now when I did that, it saved the schematic and it saved the layout. They're identical names with different extensions. And if I were to go back and load in the schematic or the layout, and I hit a button, it'll load in the companion. If you go in and change the schematic, and then you load in the, the layout, it'll tell you, I have bad news for you, your design is inconsistent. The parts and connectivity in the schematic do not jive with the parts and connectivity in the layout, and you're really uh, in, uh, you're, you're in a world of hurt at this point. You've completely messed up, and you have to figure out what can you do to revert it back to the way it was. So you always want to have the layout and the schematic up at the same time. Okay, so you, yeah, you never change one without having both of them active. Correct. And the nice thing about it is you don't have to do anything else. Like I can come in here and say, oh, I want to pull in a, a, a component and I could drop it on the schematic. I, don't, I didn't do anything on the layout and I could just keep working on my schematic and it'll just keep piling up parts on the layout. And as long as they're open at the same time, life is good. Okay, so now we're going to run the CAM tool. CAM stands for Computer Aided Manufacturing. And this essentially is the process you go through to squirt out the files that we will then take to our fab. So I, I go to the, in the layout here, there's a little icon fourth in from the left. It looks like a little turquoise icon of some sort. I don't know what it's supposed to be. You click on that guy and it brings up the cam processor. Now, when you go to an, a, a fab, uh, the fabs decide what layers in your Eagle database get mapped into what process layers at their factory. And generally, they're, they're the same from, from company to company, but not always, because depending on the equipment they have at their, at their factory, you may have different CAM files. So before you go to any um, fabricator, you always want to go to their website and look at their support info and find out, do they have a CAM file that you can download? Because you, you'll never be able to figure it out. All you could do is get the CAM file from them, install it, and then run your, your uh, layout database on that CAM file to create the right kind of data to give to them. 
So if you go to um, you know, any of a thousand PC board companies, they'll have CAM files for, uh, like I said, for, for Eagle, for KiCad, for Altium, uh, the big guys, Cadence, Mentor, Zookin, you know, all, all the, the, you know, the big companies as well. So um, I, I have a, a CAM file set that I use from Seed Studio that I've used at every PCB company I've ever used. I use the same file. They happen to work the same. So the way I do this is I go up to file and I say open job. So I'm going to run a, run a new CAM job. So I hit open job and then it gives me a dialog box and asks me which CAM file do I want to run? What configuration? I only have two that I ever use. I have one called use this <laughs> a two layer and one called use this four layer so I don't confuse myself. So uh, these came from Seed Studio. I use them f uh, everywhere and, and they work fine. And so, you know, you always want to check, make sure you use the right one. This is a, actually right now it's a one layer board. So we'll just say two. So I'll, I'll pick um, the use this GZ two layer Gerber generator. Okay, so that's loaded. So now I hit process job and it runs the task and it's done. And now I can, can close that, um, that window and, and I'm, I'm done. I can actually close out my layout now. So I can close the layout, I can uh, close my schematic. And uh, now I wanna take a look at what's in the folder that I was just in. So I'm gonna come down here to my working folder, Dropbox, projects, PCB design class, voltage regulator, and here's what I got. So what's in here now um, is, a, is the, we wanna understand what, what each of these things do. So the source code files are the SCH for schematic and BRD or Eagle board for the board. And so what I usually do at this point is I create another subfolder and I call this source. And I take my, you don't have to do this. This is just my neurotic organization. And I take my schematic file and I drop it into that folder and I take my board layout, the, the physical layout, and I drop it into that folder. Okay, and the rest of these files, these are your Gerbers. So these are the files that we need to send to the fab. So for these, I'll create another folder. Again, you don't have to, but I, I do it. And I say sent to fab. And I take um, these files here and I copy them into my sent to fab. So what that means is that um, I would do this for every version that I have of a board. So let me go into that sent to fab. So here, here's all my, my Gerbers. Now, if you look, you can look this up on the web and you can see what these extensions stand for. And they, they stand for uh, like Gerber bottom uh, layout, Gerber bottom uh, paste, Gerber bottom stencil, Gerber, you know, whatever. So these are all the files that take, take all of those, of the 256 layers in the database, the CAM processor plucked a few of them pulled them out and restructured them into these files in a specific format that was defined by that CAM file. You don't need to know how it worked, you just know that it did it. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take all these files and I'm gonna zip them together because you always send this as a packet. So I'm gonna say send to compressed zipped folder. So now I have HRWB voltage reg one dot zip. That's the thing I'm gonna send to the, um, uh, the, the fab. So uh, let me bring up, uh, my browser again. Now we can go to any one of a zillion PC board houses. Um, the one that I use the most these days is called JLC PCB. And the reason is that they're uh, price competitive. Uh, they are pretty fast. They have a good range of options and um, you know, they're great. Uh, I, I'm sure there's, I, I mean, I've used others. I've used ones in the US. The ones in the US tend to be more expensive. So the downside is, is that you know, you're, you're gonna wait for them to send it to you from China. Uh, the most expensive thing for most projects is the shipping. <laughs> so it depends on how fast you want it. Okay, so uh, you need to create an, create an account. So um, I'm just gonna go ahead and log in. And what I'm gonna show you, I could take you to 10 other board houses and the, it'll look identical. Uh, it, I mean, literally the software, the web page I'm about to show you is the same at 10 different a hundred different companies. Somebody wrote this software and they all use the same thing. So the process is very, very similar. Okay, so now I'm logged in and I'm gonna say quote now. So I click on quote now 
and uh, I get a page that lets me upload my design. So here it says, add your Gerber file. Now, your Gerber file is actually that zip file of many files in Gerber format. So I click add Gerber file, and I go to Dropbox, projects, PCB design class, voltage regulator, sent to fab, and there's my zip file, right? So I click on that and it starts uploading that file. There it goes. And voila, it even shows you an image of what your board's gonna look like. So there's a couple of really cool things here. Uh, the first thing is the latest version of the software not only shows it here, but if I hit this Gerber viewer button here, it actually gives me a really beautiful zoomed in picture of your board and you go, oh my God, my board looks gorgeous. <laughs> so it, it's kind of neat because you can really sort of see what it's gonna look like. And by the way, it's at this point before you place the order that if you're doing things like cutouts, uh, you really wanna check it to make sure it got it. And so you can see that like our notch was successful, the drill hole was successful, but the milling was not. So there's something goofy with the milling. Don't know why. The other thing that's really weird here, and I don't know why this is, if you look at the uh, voltage regulator, the first uh, pin doesn't have a pad on the top of the board. I don't know what's with that. So that could just be something weird in, the, uh, in their Gerber viewer. There's the bottom view. So that's a little odd. I'll show you another uh, trick for um, figuring out if, if this is really good or not. So we'll go back here. And so now in this view, it all looks fine. So there's our milled out hole in our pad. So I don't know, probably their Gerber viewer had an error. At this point, I'd be freaking out. And there's another third party tool that's not an Eagle tool. It's a free Gerber viewer um, that I would use to check it. And, and we can look at that in a minute. So um, since it read in the, the file, it, it automatically uh, dimensioned the, the thing for us. So let's walk through the parameters. Almost all these things you leave default. So the first thing is uh, there's two layers and it knows there's two layers because I ran the two layer um, uh, cam file. If I was making a four layer board, I'd run the four layer cam file and it would automatically say four layers and it, it knows that. It also knows the, the dimensions. When, when you price out the board, the price of the board will be a function of the size of the board and the number of holes that are in the board and to, to some degree the material that you're using as well. So the smaller the board, the cheaper it's gonna be. So it's 48 by 62 millimeters. I didn't have to tell it that, it figured it out. And then the, the first thing you're gonna do is decide how many you want. And the smallest number you can get is five. Uh, for small boards, small simple boards, by the time you buy the boards and pay the postage, whether you get five or 25, kinda of doesn't matter. So we'll take a look at the price here. For five boards, uh, we'll finish out the specs. Uh, let's see, uh, five boards, uh, it's one design. That's default. Delivery format is as a single printed circuit board as opposed to a panel. In other words, a bunch of them tiled together. You'll never do that. Now you might change the PCB thickness. The default of 99% of the boards you'll ever do is 1.6 millimeters. That's the standard value. Um, when I do boards that, uh, that have to be more robust, I'll use two, millim two millimeters. So the, uh, the RF relay board that I did recently, I did with two millimeters because I'm screwing and unscrewing PL259s and I, I, you know, I'm gonna put more torque on the board. And so, okay, I'll, it costs more money. It's like gonna double the price if you go to a thicker board. Um, the more standardized you keep it, the cheaper it'll be. So we'll leave it at 1.6. Uh, what color do you want your board material to be? You know, is green acceptable or do you wanna be fashionable and go to blue or black or yellow or something else? Um, I've used all these different colors. Um, at one point or another. Um, green is free, all the other ones cost you money. So if we switch to blue, for example, um, when we go calculate the price, it should jack up the price a little bit. So we'll stick with green. <clears throat> now you need to decide what your um, solder material finish is. So HASL leaded is standard leaded um, traces. If you wanna go lead free, then you'd click lead free. Uh, the ENIG Rojas, this is like gold plated, which looks gorgeous, but totally unnecessary. Personally, uh, I, I almost always get leaded. If I'm, if I'm building a commercial project that has to be fabricated and sold in the real world, then I would go with lead free. But um, for building prototypes, leaded is much easier. So, you know, I would just go with leaded. 
Uh, how thick do you want the copper? Um, they offer one and two ounce. Two ounce is, gives you twice the current handling capacity at twice the price or something like that. So if you're doing a small signal board like a power supply like this, the traces are plenty wide. I wouldn't bother to change it. One ounce is the standard. 99% of your projects will be one ounce. Only weird things that require doubling the current capacity, you go to two. Do you need gold fingers? We don't have any fingers, so no. Material type. Uh, here we pick FR4, which is the standard fiberglass. Uh, you can pick other materials that are a bit more exotic, but you don't need it. FR4 is very good quality material. It's not the cheapest junk. It's perfectly acceptable. Uh, if you're going to do RF circuits uh, at very high frequencies, then you might go to some other materials like Rogers, which is really more for impedance controlled RF circuits. You'll never, I mean, unless you're building a, you know, 1.2 gigahertz LNA or whatever, you're not gonna do that. So FR4 default is fine. Uh, uh, fully, fully test is, is default, that's fine. Ca there's no castellated holes. Castellated hole means that there's, um, ever see a board that looks like a postage stamp? So there, there's like a solder pad that's like an arc with, with some pad on the top, like they, they had a hole but they cut through it, that's castellation. Um, generally you don't do that. Uh, and that's it. And there's, there's really nothing else to do. So all we had to tell it was uh, how many boards and change nothing else. Like there's, there's nothing to do. And if you look over at the right, here's the price. So uh, the price is $2. Uh, and then shipping estimate is $17 by DHL Express. Uh, I only ship DHL Express because they're traceable, trackable, very reliable, and very fast. And if you have the option to ship by almost any other international carrier. DHL is um, the equal to or the cheapest of anybody you've ever heard of before. So if you get FedEx or um, you know anybody like that, DHL is less expensive. Uh, the cheaper way is like China Post, which just means you're gonna get it like three times longer maybe, if ever. So uh, is that price uh, per board or for the entire order? For the entire order. So if we go up here and say, I don't want five boards. I mean, at two bucks, man, I want 50. I got a lot of friends. So it's going to recalculate it and say the engineering fee is now eight bucks. The boards are 650. Holy cow, that's cheap. And um, so now the shipping is $18 because these boards are so tiny. So, you know, this, th this is a quick way to get a lot of a lot of bad boards. Like if you do a bad design, you're going to like build one and go, oh, it doesn't work. And I got 19 extras. Um, so, you know, small board. This is why this is, okay, pause. This is the reason why you should never hand wire a vector board in your life. You know, if you don't need it in the next 20 minutes, why would you do that? Because the price of this is so cheap. And odds are any project you think of you probably have a friend who'd like to build it too. So for the price of one, you, you, I mean, you, well, you can't even get one. For the price of five, you might as well get 25. Um, now it, it gets much more expensive when you get more layers and you get more components and a lot more drill holes and all that scales the price up. But for something this trivial, it's pretty simple. Um, just, just to sort of finish this off, we, we would say save to cart. And, um, and the next thing is we buy it. You know, and there you see it in your cart, and there it is, 1450. Um, uh, let's see, yeah, for for as many as what do we do? Quantity of 50 is 1450 plus 18 bucks shipping. So for 30 bucks, you got 50 boards, less than a buck a board, and you'll get them in about one to two weeks. So it'll take them. Um, a, a, you can figure to be conservative. It takes them from the time you hit the button. It takes them a week to make it because what they do is they aggregate orders together. So they don't do it just for you. They get hundreds of orders a day and they'll take yours and everybody else's. They'll tile them together to fit a huge board. They'll make a bunch of those. Then they'll dice them all up and package them. So that's how they get some of the economy of scale. So it'll take them a week to make the board. Then it'll take as long as it takes to ship it, depending on what you pay for it. DHL takes a week. So uh, on the average, I'm seeing boards in less than two weeks. Originally, when I worked with these guys, it was three weeks, but now they're getting much better. Uh, if you want to see some other prices here, uh, let's go to order history. And um, like I was just mentioning that um, uh, you, you can see I, 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 I've done a few boards um, over time, uh, which is kind of a mania in and of itself. So here is the uh, four, two by four uh, latching relay board. This is the, um, 
the board that is uh, two millimeters. I think I made this two millimeters thick. Uh, I'm not sure if I changed the copper weighting. Um, I thought it'd show me the price. Oh, that's the Gerber view. Uh, here we go. Okay, so that board was, uh, let's see, five pieces, 1170. Um, oh, plus I, I did another one, which was a, um, another relay board. So two boards, that was 780. Uh, so that was $19 worth, worth of two different boards plus 20 bucks shipping. Here's a teeny weeny little board. This is a, a little XB size data radio board. Um, 25 pieces um, for 50 bucks. That's two bucks a board. Um, anyway, you sort of get the picture. Oh, this is, this is kind of uh, a crazy, this is a really big board. Uh, this is a, uh, a really big project that had a beagle bone and an ethernet switch and uh, not that many parts, but it was a very big board. So this guy was uh, more, obviously more expensive. So this one was uh, five pieces for $80. And what really drove, oh, plus shipping is 30 bucks. So for $110, so, so $20-ish a board. What drove the cost of this was the size. So when you go from a you know, two by three board to a eight by 15 inch board, then the, the price goes up uh, pretty significantly. But you, know, you would expect that. So anyway, that's the whole process. Um, at this point, we put in our credit card, hit the go button and sit back and wait. And then your boards show up. So Steve's asking uh, if you've designed a small board, is it cheaper to order 10 of your board or duplicate the circuit and have them etch five at a time? Uh, oh, that's a good question. Um, so if you, if you duplicate the circuit, you're basically panelizing the design. So then you have to come up with a way to, uh, to break the panel apart. And there's a few techniques for that. So uh, let's say you, you've got two identical circuits side by side. Um, you could put a, roll, a, hole, a row of holes so you can snap it off, uh, or you can do what they call a V score, where they, they, they grind in like a 45, it's actually a 90 degree cut at 45 degrees on the top and bottom, it's a scribe line, which makes it easier to snap them apart. You can also route like hot dog shape things with just a small number of connection points. Personally, I never do that because it's not that much cheaper and it just looks cheesy. <laughs> I hate the look of the, those little imperfect edges or those rough edges. And even if it's going in a box and no one's ever going to see it, but me, I just, I can't sleep at night. Knowing it's, like, that. it's like pulling a sheet of paper out of a wire, wire bound <laughs> notebook. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. The neurotic in me would just, I couldn't sleep at night. And, and so for another two bucks, like I'll make it beautiful. Because this is like restoring a Model T, you know, it's you, you chrome the parts and put them inside the motor. I mean, no one's ever going to see it, but you know it's there. Um, now, if I if I were making a consumer electronics device and I could care less and was looking to shave every penny off of it, I would panelize it. So, sure. George, uh, will next week's episode... Oh, by the way, it, hang on a second, Rod. The real, the real reason to panelize, by the way, is not to get the price of the board down. I mean, it, it, it helps. The real reason to panelize is for assembly. So if you're going to, let's say you have a little board and you've got 10 parts on that little board, the handling of a little board is harder than the handling of a big board, as you could imagine. So if you go through the wave solder machine or the pick and place machine, doing pick and place on one big board with the same number of parts as 10 little boards is easier on a big board. And the assembly house will charge you less money. So if you panelize and you put 100 parts on one board, it, it'll be cheaper than putting 10 parts on 10 boards. So that's really why you, why you panelize. Sorry, go ahead, Rod. So looking at your order history here, I'm thinking next week's episode is what kind of crazy crafts can you do with leftover boards? <laughs> well, it helps if your wife is an engineering teacher and teaches soldering and robotics, then you have an instant home for, so you don't feel so bad generating all this scrap. Oh, and a tax deduction to boot. <laughs> Duly noted. Hey, nice. George, what... Um, You'd mentioned, uh, again, rules like, um, or I, and I saw when you hovered over, there was a design rule check, right? At some point, um, how do you define like the minimum trace width and how close traces can get together and do those vary depending on what manufacturer you go to? Or is there some hobby level 
you know, that you just set and it works pretty much across whatever vendors you use? Uh, that's a great question. I completely skipped that. So I'm going to go back to the layout editor and just show you that really quick. So I'm going to go back to you my- You did mention those minimum, those manufacturer minimums before. So yeah. that, is that part of it? Uh, yes, it is. It, yeah, it, that would be part of it. And the good news is you don't have to really be too concerned about this because the odds are you're never going to design a board that gets close to what the fabrication limits are. And um, you can just run a design rule check with the standard rules and they will probably be perfectly fine. And the only reason you would ever modify the rules um, is if you were really pushing the limits or you had a corporate standard and you had to enforce the corporate standard and prove it. So I, I never, I've never modified the design rule definition file. So what I'm gonna do here is um, go into, if you look at the lower right hand icon, it says DRC, that's a physical design rule. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, um, I forget if I have to highlight it or not. So I'm gonna highlight everything, then I'm gonna click on design rule check and up it comes and says, all right, just like with the CAM processor, this is the DRC processor. And there's all kinds of configuration parameters I could put in here like, uh, what are the layers I'm checking for? Um, what's the, uh, the distance? Here's where you can define what the inner trace uh, min-max distances are. So uh, what's the, you know, the, the distance between wires? What's the difference between pads? Uh, what are the sizes? You know, what's the minimum width of a trace? Um, you know, board stack ups, uh, shapes, solder mask. So all this stuff you can tune. And, the, I, and these are, but they're defaults for all of them, right? Correct. The, this is what you're looking at is out of the box. It just comes out of the box and I would just run this this way. So I, all I would do is say, hit the check button and it runs the DRC uh, job and nothing came back. So let's, let's uh, violate a rule. So let's do this. I'm going to come in here. I'm going to grab this, this pad and I'm going to put it here. So I'm going to overlap these two pads. Let's see if it finds that. So I'm going to come back here, bring up DRC, hit check. And look at that, now it popped up um, four violations. So it says I've got uh, two clearance violations on layer 16, which is the bottom copper, and I've got uh, two overlap violations on the top and the bottom. So if I zoom in here, you can see how it has this red cross hatch. So you can see that that's where the, the, the error occurred. Um, now, if I wasn't too sure and I had a bunch of parts, if I click on one of these guys, like if I click on the first one, it shoots an arrow to the spot. And if I keep clicking on these, it's all pointing to the same thing. But this is how you can see exactly what the error is. So if I come back here and I grab this, this pad and I pull it back, let's say um, I go to there and then I'm going to um, approve all of these. I'm gonna really undo this and I'm gonna rerun my DRC check and now it passed. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to uh, do one other thing. I'm going to rip this guy up and I'm gonna route um, a trace. Between these two. Now, um, this is actually a pretty useful exercise. Now take a look at this. It, electrically, is that is that gonna work? Yeah. Uh, they're on the same layer, right? Uh, correct. So the blue is the bottom. The green is top and bottom because it's a solder pad. So, so there is a very tiny little gap between that trace and this pad. So electrically, this is perfectly fine. This could be a lousy design technique because there's a probability of shorting this out either in manufacturing or, or after the fact in assembly. So let's see what happens when we run DRCs again. So check. Oh, look, violation. Uh, I've got a clearance violation. So now the violation is between the, uh, the donut, the solder pad and the trace. So even though if I fabricated this, there's a 99% chance that it would actually work. It's just a lousy practice. And so, well, how could I solve that problem? I could move the pads further apart or maybe I could come in here to the properties and I could change the width to um, 0.012 inches. So now it's skinnier. Uh, so now let's go back and run the DRC again check. And oh, look, we still have violation. It's still no good. Let's make it even smaller. Let's go down to uh, point, how about zero, zero, five. Now, and I could print that, no problem. Uh, and I'll run my DRC. And uh, still have a violation. So even if I go down to that, that size, it's no good. So I really have to move these things around. So 
like I said, un unless you have a particular set of rules you're trying to adhere to, I just run the stock rules and, and I've, they've always been perfectly fine. So that's how you run the DRCs. Thank you. Always a good, good thing to do. Um, last thing here, let me show you one other thing here. Uh, I'm going to bring up this free tool. George, is there a bomb maintained in the tool so you ah. can spit that out into a CSV or something? Yeah, so let me, let me show you. If we, if we go over here to um, the, the schematic, um, if I go up here to the top, there's two little icons. One says execute a script or execute a ULP. That's user something program. It's like a macro. If I, if I click on run ULP, it gives me a big list of, of programs that I can run that does stuff a big list, like renumber pages, uh, generate a net list, all kinds of things. Well, the very first one alphabetically is bomb. So if I click on the bomb button, voila, I have a bill of materials. Oh. So there's your bomb. Now, now the question is, is that bomb any use to you or not? Um, the answer is kinda. <laughs> so if, if, if you're going to an assembly house, could you hand them this bomb and would it be sufficient? Uh, there's a body of work that needs to happen to actually map this into specific purchased parts still at this point. Um, so sometimes if you're very explicit about the part you put in your schematic, like I want a pick 18F8722 dash IP, that's a, there's a specific part in the universe, you know, well, they make a million of them, but there's a particular kind of part that is that, that part number will show up and that directly maps to something you can buy. But if I put in 0.1 microfarad capacitor, it, it, there's, that's not a part number. That's, that's a, it, a footprint and, a, and a, a value. So somebody has to either take this and add, you know, bring this to a spreadsheet and add to it like a DigiKey part number or a manufacturer's part number to know what to order. Or the other option is you could, you could have gone in here and, and said, um, added a property to this guy. So you could give it a, a, a property, which is the manufacturing part number uh, here somewhere. Where is it? Oh, I'm not sure, I don't see it there. Uh, I might've had to put it on the symbol, but you, you can, oh, maybe it's attribute. Yeah, so if, if I create a new attribute called MANUF and I give it a value of one, two, three, dash, four, five, six, seven, dash, and D, which is a made up uh, DigiKey part number. Um, and I said, okay, that part, that part number is now, that is attached to this part. So let's see what happens if we rerun our bomb. Guess what? Oh, it worked, what a surprise. So there you see um, it added a new field called manuf. And you can see that that particular capacitor has a value of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven dash ND. So if you, if you now go through the time and the energy to put that attribute on every one of your parts, you'll be able to create a, a bomb with the real orderable part numbers. So the way you don't want to do this is the way I did it, which is to add it to that instance of the part. Cause I've got, you know, 10,000 part of the same point one capacitor. I don't want to put on 10,000 times. So you go back to your library editor, you add the, you add the attribute to the source symbol with that, that attribute called manuf with that value. And every time you pull that part of the library, it'll bring that attribute with it. So a couple questions here, George. Um, the fab site was in metric. Are there any issues, uh, SAE versus metric? No, no, it doesn't matter. Um, okay, cool. The fact that the ordering was in metric is doesn't matter at all. Um, you, when you do the layout, you could do it either way. So uh, if we bring this back up here, um, we go up to view grid. I could define the grid either in inches or millimeters, mils, uh, or microns. So I could do it in whatever. If I do, if I go to millimeter and change my unit to one, so now I'm on a grid of one millimeter. Very good. Okay, the Gerber viewer program that you referenced earlier. Uh, which one were you thinking of? Yeah, it's called GERBV, G-E-R-B-V, um, and you could just Google it. I'll show you what it looks like. Uh, here it is. So G-E-R-B-V from G-E-D-A. And uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say open um, layers. 
Oh, actually, I think I need to, uh, now it's spinning the wheel. I think I need to point to the folder. Oh, that's good. Not responding. Okay. Hand wavy, hand wavy. What do you want um, for free? <laughs> exactly. Um, Glenn was asking, uh, how about Snap EDA that links parts to suppliers? Yeah. Um, so that is good. Um, if you if you get libraries for Eagle or for KiCad that have manufacturing part numbers or distributor part numbers, that's good too. Um, Snap EDA is is good that way, um, and they they may be. Uh, I think Snap EDA you have to use their EDA tools. I don't think I don't think you can use like KiCad or Eagle to front end it, but I, I'm not sure. I've not used it. So this is a very good. We are dangerously close to the two hour mark. We knew we'd get there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so let me just describe this and then you know, since it's still whatever, not, there we go. Not, well, let's just finish this off. Let's do uh, open layers. Uh, let me just navigate to that. I'll show you this real quick and then we'll wrap up. I think doing the zoom thing is making it difficult. Let's do Dropbox. Okay, so I'm gonna go into our uh, fab folder. And so here's all of our layers. Uh, and I'm gonna say open, and it'll, and it'll open all of those layers. Uh, I go over to the layers tab. Oh, it didn't show them. Open layers. Oh, I should select them. Open. Okay, so now what you see is uh, all of those Gerber files are now l shown laid on top of one another and I can selectively turn them off. So I'm gonna turn them all off except the first layer. Okay, so uh, in the first layer, uh, what you're seeing here, this is the bottom um, copper and you can also see where the holes um, are. If I turn that off and go to the next one, this is the, um, that's the milling, or not the milling, the, um, the outlines again. Uh, again, this is the solder mask for the bottom, probably. This is, this is like sending a multicolor uh, silkscreen design to a printer. Exactly, Ex exactly. So here, here's, speaking of silkscreen, here's the ink that gets printed. Um, then, uh, you know, more mechanical, more solder mask, uh, and these, this is the holes. These are where the, the holes are in the size. The reason why this is useful, I'll tell you what, I, I found uh, errors on boards using this tool. And the, what I do is, is what, when you're done designing your board, you, you've looked at it for so long, you're absolutely sure you found every single problem. And then you exit out, you go into this tool, you bring it in, and then you look at just the top layer, or you look at just the bottom layer. And probably half the time, there's a, there's a short, you know, this trace runs over that trace and you just didn't see it because when you look at the layout, you've got so much stuff going on that that one, or, or I've had a trace that would like run over a donut pad and I didn't run the DRC, dumb me. I was going to say the DRC would check that. Normally, absolutely. It? It, yeah. But I was lazy and didn't run it. And, 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 but I caught it looking at the Gerber view. Uh, the other thing that is funny is, is that you, you can look at the silk screen and go, oh my God, there's text all over the place. And I want to really adjust it so it looks pretty. Now, everything I just described, you could do in the layout tool because you can turn off all the layers except just those and see it in the, in the layout mm. editor. There's, there's something about doing it in another tool that is kind of a good sanity check. And it, you know, it's not exactly logical, but it, it, it definitely helps me. So I always do that. Okay, so I, we've hit the limit. Uh, any other questions? I'll stick around for a few minutes if anybody has questions. Oh, what, how do you get Eagle? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so there's a link uh, in the PDF that I put on the on the podcast web page. Uh, there's a link to the free version, and um, I, I would use that. Okay, thank you. And what what is the uh, what is the current version cost? Gosh, I don't know. I I bought uh, the version I bought was this six version uh, before when it was a perpetual license, and now it's an annual license, and I. I think they have different versions at different prices, depending on what features you want. Okay. And I'm, I, I'm not sure what the cheapest one is. I think it's like a hundred bucks a year or something like that, but I, okay. I'm not hundred percent sure. The one thing uh, that uh, I found George is that I, I've got a license 
for the, the hobbyist version of Fusion 360. Mm -hmm. And I originally had the free version of Eagle. And those two are now, there's a deal going that if you own one, you get rights to the other. And so my hobbyist license for Fusion 360 has given me access to Eagle Premium uh, on the latest version. Oh, so cool. That might be something of interest for folks that, uh, that are out there as maybe a route to get to a little more capability within the current version of Eagle if they're interested. And that's an area that I've really wanted to spend more time in is, is in the mechanical packaging side of things. So well, I, I use that's, different that's great. Uh, right. Design. I'm not yeah. Consistent <laughs> packaging on that piece, but that might just be something of, of interest to folks. Yeah, that's a great idea. I think if you if you want to dive in, that's one of the reasons to consider it. If you go with with KiCad, I think they could do a 3D uh, projection, like a stack up of what the board might look like as a prototype, but they don't have the mechanical uh, 3D packaging part. George, in the PowerPoint, you had mentioned uh, your your library, and then I think SparkFun, and anyway, some others. Um, I guess my question is uh, for folks like this audience that want to build things similar to you, uh, would you recommend we start looking in a library like yours if you're willing to share it, or is there a certain library order you recommend we, you know, we peruse, or what do you do before you figure out that a part's not available and then you have to build it, which is a totally different show, I know, but. Um. <laughs> yeah, John, good question. Um, the, the libraries I recommended have a lot of hobbyist parts, which you can also get from the people that, that create the libraries. So Sparkfront, Adafruit, and uh, Seed Studio. Uh, those are all good libraries. That's why I recommended those. You're welcome to my library. There's, there are parts in my library which uh, I've customized. Like I, I, I might have found the part in another library, but I didn't like the footprint or the uh, schematic symbol, so I might have changed it. Uh, or there are hard to find parts. Like I have a Micor Squelch chip part. Well, that's never going to be in an Eagle library, so I just create my own part. So I, I'll do things like that. And, and you're welcome to have a, a copy of my library. I'll publish it. Uh, but I think um, I would use those other ones. Uh, one of the things that, that's a natural thing to go to next, uh, by the way, is if you want to have boards assembled, uh, there's a whole nother uh, part of this if you want to do assembly. So when I, what I mean by assembly is actually stuff in the parts in the board. So if you're building a you know, 10 part board and you're making one board, then of course, you know, we're, we build stuff. But if you have uh, an idea for your get rich quick retirement scheme, uh, you don't want to be stuffing a thousand boards. You want um, you know, you, your kids to do that. <laughs> you want someone else to do it. So the one interesting thing is, is as prices of automated circuit board stuff has come down, the prices of automated assembly has come down remarkably. So you can, um, you can go to a lot of services uh, like Seed Studio or Osh Park or others and have them do a whole uh, circuit board and assembly um, and send you back a completed set of circuit boards. So it doesn't make sense for one, but it certainly does make sense for, um, for a handful of them. Uh, it might make sense for one if you're using all surface mount parts and you just don't wanna deal with it. Uh, the, the cheapest way to do that, by the way, is to go with a PC board vendor that has their own part library. So. Um, this is kind of a new thing. So uh, Seed Studio is a great example, and there's many others, where they have what they call their open parts library, the OPL. There's about 150,000 parts in the library. And what that means is that, is that you can pull parts out of their Eagle library, and that those parts in the Eagle library, they have in stock. So if you decide to have them assemble it for you, they have the parts, and the cost of assembly will be minimum. Um, relative to going to a normal assembly house where what they, what, they, what they normally do is they look at your bill of materials, then they have to go buy all those parts and get them in and make all the pick and place tapes. And you know that, all that costs money. And so all these automated things are all about cost avoidance. And so what they're trying to do is to automate it. And one way to do that is to have a finite set of parts that are available and always available. So you know we all use 7805s and 0.1 microfarad capacitors and you know we all use jelly bean parts and you know for a lot of boards they'll have all the parts that you need or you can morph your design to use the part they have. Alrighty so I think we're kind of at the limit of time um, so thanks very much I hope uh, we didn't get to the second half by the way that was the first 20 minutes um, 
So Paul's going to send me an email complaining about <laughs> the fact that I failed to achieve the goal number two. So, well, I was going to ask when uh, when uh, one hundred two is. Uh, this was one hundred one. Yeah. Um, so actually, if you have five minutes, we can do one hundred two right now. Um, it's really quick. I, I don't want to keep you, George. Uh, if if you know. Well, it, it would just take a minute. So sure. truthfully, so if you want to hang on, so let, we'll just do that real quick. And the question here was, well, how do we make an add-on board for the bench do we know? So uh, the, um, the footprint for the board, we, we published, uh, open sourced it. So, right. um, so here you can see in, in the navigation pane of, of Eagle, I have bench do we know DIY proto board. And I just click on that and here's the schematic. And then I, I click the um, layout window and there's the layout. So this is what you start with. And the reason why this is what you start with is that we defined exactly what the outer board dimensions are and exactly where the interconnect pins are so that if you fabricated this, everything would line up properly. So you don't have to figure that out. Everything else is up to you. So uh, we've uh, predefined what those signals are uh, that are coming off of the, uh, the Arduinos. So if we were gonna do a, a simple circuit here, um, Okay, let's, uh, let's do this. Let's take, we'll get a relay. If I type relay, I'm sure there'll be at least one. Well, where do we begin? So lots of relays. Let's go to one that I use. We'll go down to my, my library, maybe if it's up here. Oh, here's, here's a common one, a TQ2. All right. Uh, TQ2, five volt. Okay, very common relay. I dropped the schematic symbol here. There's the relay. This happens to be a surface mount relay. They make a through hole version of that thing too. Uh, I'm also going to uh, buffer this. Let's put in a, um, a 2N 2222 garden variety NPN transistor. So we'll, we'll bring that up here. And then uh, I need a resistor. So come in here, type resistor. And uh, let's see. Let's go with a through hole. We'll do a um, quarter watt resistor. Okay. Um, so that's kind of what we need. So let's, uh, let's just focus on the schematic for a second. Uh, I'm going to take my resistor and I'm gonna hook it up to uh, Arduino pin D3. So I'm gonna take the resistor, touch it to that end of that wire, click on it, click on it again and drag it over here. So it, you know it's connected. This is the acid test for is the connection made. So there's my resistor. I'm gonna take my transistor, hook the base up to the transistor. Uh, then I'm gonna take my uh, emitter of the transistor and I'm gonna hook it to ground. Now there's ground up here or I could just put a wire here and add a label and then name that label uh, the same as what I called it up there, which, which is DGND, digital ground. So if you look, if you look up here, yep. these two pins are DGND, that's digital ground. And then there's the I2C bus above that and then voltage is up here. And uh, so then the collector of my transistor will go to the one side of the relay and then the other side of the relay will go to voltage. And if this is a five volt relay, then I'll hook it up to my five volt source. So far, so good? Yep. Okay, so um, uh, I need one other thing to make this electrically work. I need to put a diode, a clamping diode across this to make it work right. So let's go uh, about one and 4,004. Let's get a big beefy, oop, can't find that. Extra one, zero. There we go. There's my diode. I'm gonna put it right here. So you put the, um, the anode going to the ground side and the cathode going to the voltage side. That way when the, when the coil uh, de-energizes, the reverse EMF doesn't blow out your transistor. So it'll protect the transistor. So then now I have the contacts for my relay. And so uh, let's say I wanna put a connector on here. So I'll, oh, I don't know. What kind of connector should we use? I'll put a terminal block. So I'll type terminal star block. Ooh, that got nothing. Terminal block. 
terminal. Okay. And those are all chips. Uh, let's do, bring up everything and let's go to connectors, connector, coax connector. Okay. Uh, Molex, how about a Molex connector? Let's look at Molex. There's a million Molex connectors. <laughs> All right, uh, that's kind of pointless for this application. All right, let's use one of these. All right, so I'm gonna put this connector over here. So what I wanna do is, is uh, hook up one pin to um, this side of the relay and um, the common side of the relay goes here. So there's a single pull, single throw connection. So when I, when I drive D3 to a positive voltage, I put five volts off the Arduino, so logic one goes here. That logic one biases this transistor on, makes this a path to ground, completes the circuit, actuates the relay, closes the contacts. So when in my Arduino sketch, D3 goes high, this connection shunts. Okay, so let's take a look at the uh, layout. There's all the parts. I'm gonna grab all the parts uh, with a, uh, grabbing them, draw a box around it, uh, and then I uh, right click with the control button held down and I drag them all over here. And then I grab my connector and I bring it over and right click it to rotate it into position. And then I'm gonna take my relay and I'm gonna keep my traces short. Put it right there. I put my transistor there, my resistor, and then rotate that around there. Now- You're you gonna flip that connector so that uh, they don't cross? Uh, we could, or, or we can just put this on different layers. So may, maybe this is like on this connector, this uh, rectangle on the left might be a vertical uh, tab of plastic and that's probably on the inside. So you probably wanna leave it this way. Okay. Uh, now the only tricky thing is that being a surface mount relay, um, I, I have to go through a via to the other side of the board. So we'll do that. Um, if, the, if the airlines look ugly, you can always do what's called the rat's nest command. You can just type rats for short and it'll snap everything. Once you've placed it, it'll snap everything. So it's a little bit neater. So we'll clean this up a hair. Um, so now we'll go ahead and route this. So I'll right click on this trace and say route. Uh, and I'll come down over here. And oh look, um, surface mount part, red, top layer, blue, bottom layer, that's not gonna work. So I need to change this trace to put it on the top layer. So what I could do is I can say change layer one, return and that's the new mode. And when I click on something, it changes that trace to layer one and puts a via at the last junction. Now I can go into my route command and finish the route. And so now it's good. So, so now I'm bringing my voltage over to the, the coil. Uh, I'm going to route the rest of this stuff on layer one because I don't need to change layers. It's kind of ugly. We'll go to a 45, make it a little bit prettier. That's a pretty direct shot. Uh, the output of the transistor will run right over to here. The resistor will go to the base. And then our emitter goes to ground. And then our logic control signal goes here. Now, the only last thing we have to do is this part here. Now, I, I, I put this on layer one. So if these cross over right here, I, I don't have three layers to play with unless I go to a four layer board. So what I could do is I could grab this and just move it over and put it underneath the part, which is perfectly fine. So uh, this guy, I'll, I'll route over and out. And this guy, if I routed him over and out, I have a short. If I just move, if this was a through hole relay, I could put this whole thing on layer 16 on the bottom and it would be fine, but right. I can't. So what I'm gonna do is um, I'm gonna move this guy over, then I'm gonna say change layer 16, or I could say change layer bottom. And I'm gonna tap on these two signals. And so now it's fine. So now they're not shorted together because the blue's on the bottom, the red's on the top, and my circuit's good. Uh, if I were really making a serious circuit, of course, I would also change with to 0 0.04 or something bigger and beefier like that to handle more current. Uh, this via looks tiny to me, so I would right-click right on, the, on the via 
go to properties and I would change the hole size. So the drill hole I'd make bigger. Why? Because the bigger the hole, the more plated uh, copper and the more current. So I want to puff that thing up to, I don't know, 0 0.039 looks better. I hate square pads. So I'm going to right click it again, go to properties and change uh, the, the um, shape from square to round because I think it looks better. And uh, that looks good. Uh, and that would be perfectly fine. These traces could, for reliability, these traces could be fatter, but electrically they're perfectly fine. Okay. And, uh, and there you go. Awesome. All right. Similar so the, mindset on uh, what Tim mentioned today. I think this was my partner out on uh, Facebook was talking about uh, creating a, a board for the SPM32. We'd find a library that had that footprint um, in it, and then use that, and then route the signals correctly to the uh, uh, to the headers that are already in place in the in the file that's available for download from you, right? Yeah, that's right. What you'll also find is as you do more and more of these projects that every project looks like a derivative of the last project. And what, what, you'll, what you'll figure out is uh, you can bang out a new project because you're used to using the same 50 parts. Right. And in fact, uh, every new project never starts with a blank schematic. It always starts with a copy of the old schematic of the old project. And then you spend 20 minutes ripping out the stuff you don't need and starting to assemble the new circuit out of the parts that you do need. Um, so you'll, you'll wind up with the same power supply circuit, this, you know, likely over and over again for multiple projects. And, and that's how you get really, it's like any other thing, you know, you build your kit of, of tips and tricks that, that you use in your favorite circuits and favorite parts. Sure. And also, by the way, uh, that also, if you do build a lot of circuits, it does help in building your junk box. Because if, if I need a little small signal relay and there's 10,000 different ones to pick from, I pick one that serves my purpose. And every project will use the same relay because I got 20 of them in a tube. So I just reuse the same part. I know exactly how they work and I know how big they are and any other peculiarities you get familiar with. Same thing with processors like the Arduino or the PIX or you know, interfaces and stuff. So I think, I think that'll be a wrap. Rod, I want to really thank you so much for, for hosting this. Mark, did you have a question? Yeah, I just, um, I, at some point here, and, and maybe in and certainly a different venue, is that I'm interested in, in kind of lessons learned on the um, CPU daughter boards. Sure. And so, you know, I think that's a, I, you know, before I, you, have the, you have like the, um, the prototype board, you have the CPU daughter board, but I bet you there were some decisions made on which, which ones gets routed which, which you've done four of them you probably that's something which you know even just a round table like gee if i was going to do it this way or, yeah the, the uh, biggest learning there was the actual routing of the processor boards w was not critical because they're all low frequency anything that's like 40 megahertz like a pick uh is not critical at all uh the the raspberry pi all the high speed stuff is on the board all the off-board io is slow so there is very little that was critical in the routing at all for those boards um, it was just general hygiene of keep things spaced apart and make traces big enough. Uh, the, the biggest thought was really in the architecture, which is um, how do you come up with a standardized interconnect scheme that could support several different processors with a wide range of different pin counts? Right. And um, there's no way you could solve that problem and be able to use every possible feature on every possible processor and not have a bazillion pins and, and not use most of them. So it was really an exercise in, in finding the common features. Uh, and in a way, I sort of um, really leaned on Arduino as the most likely target and said, okay, at a bare minimum, it's got to be great for an Arduino Uno equivalent and, or an Arduino Mega. Um, and then if you put a pick on there instead, what would you do differently? Is, is there a subset? You know, are there like five more pins you would add? Hopefully not double. Uh, same with a Raspberry Pi, and, and that was really the the exercise to really compare the pin sets. And I had yeah, done a ton of projects with picks, so it was easy to compare. Yeah, no, it was just kind of like mapping. Okay, you know, it's this this pin. You know, it's the thought process that this pin kind of is actually yeah know, would go over here. You know, so the you mean the physical is, location? Well, not not as much that as as just you're trying to to you know, you, especially let's say let's say you have a teeny. A teeny teensy four one, which has you know a million pins, well mm -hmm. a lot, and and so which ones of those do you actually bring out? 
Yeah, actually, that wasn't too hard. Uh, the 90% of the answer is easy. It's the last 10% that's the hard part. So the easy part is, well, okay, let's start with the obvious thing. So everybody needs power and ground, right? You, you probably want a reset pin. Uh, you want uh, I2C clock and data because it's only two pins and everything runs I2C and every sensor out there you can get an I2C. Um, uh, you want UART support because we do a lot of stuff with UARTs and ham radio gear. So um, the Arduino Mega happened to have four UARTs and so I reserved four UARTs because I do a lot of projects with a lot of UARTs. So that was a little UART rich. Uh, I didn't feel the need to do two I2C pairs because one is sufficient, uh, even though some of the processors have multiples. Um, the next logical thing is uh, ADCs, so analog to digital converters. The, um, the Arduinos had, uh, like the Mega has like 16 or 20 or something like that. And I, so I reserved so many pins for ADCs, uh, so many, a couple pins for PWMs. Um, spy bus was kind of the big sacrifice. So I kind of gave up on trying to support the spy bus, partly because every time you add another spy peripheral, you need another chip select pin. And it just starts to get kind of messy and almost everything in spy, you can get an I2C. So I kind of thought, well, you could, you could do it, but I'm not gonna go out of my way to make it particularly easy for spy parts. So that was, I kind of gave up on that. Um, the other consideration is that uh, five volts or 3.3 volts. So both, so that had to be factored in. Uh, and the rest is all digital IO. Uh, I mean, the rest, you know, and everything else is all digital uh, IO. So it really, it was, that was the, pretty much the process. Okay, now, now was there any reason that you wouldn't put some pins on top of the daughter board? You know, so if you wanted access to additional, additional pins? Uh, you could. Um, you know, you, 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 yeah, I mean, you certainly, you could do that. Like, I, I think that would be a good idea. So for a, what we wind up with is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, 64 pins. So there's 64 pins of interconnect and a few of them are doubled up like power and ground, but mostly there's 64 signal pins. Um, if you look at something like the um, 18F uh, 8722 PICS, which I've used in our repeater controller projects, that's an 80 pin QFP. Now, granted, there's many power and ground pins, but there's more pins on that part than you could put on a 64 pin daughter card. Sure. Uh, so if I were really gonna do it right, I probably should have put another header on there. Um, so yeah, that, that would be a reasonable thing to do. Okay. George, I'm going to have to duck out. This is Marty. Thank you so much. This has uh, given me all sorts of cool ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Marty. It's so nice to hear from you again. All right. You guys take care, everybody. Right. Hey, so if anybody else wants to do some daughter board work, um, you know, I'll put some, as I get going on, on, on that, I'll put it on the uh, Facebook page. And I'd be happy to, uh, to uh, you know, help out in any way I can, Mark. Yeah, Mike.